Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome for the third session of this nice workshop and, and uh, well organized. Um, okay, so I'm Marie Weiss, and uh, Michel Ganem uh, is also co chair of this session for about uh, for dynamic and functional traits. And uh, Michel uh, begins with the first talk, the talk about phenotyping for drought tolerance. Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice dinner yesterday <laughs> and you're fresh uh, to the sessions today. Okay, so uh, I come from a university called Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in, in Morocco, which is a, a recent, recently established university. And I'll be discussing some recent, uh, some realistic physiological options to improve uh, resistance to drought. But before going any further, yesterday's Oops, is it on? Yesterday's presentations reminded me of a movie that I've seen. I don't know if you've seen that movie <laughs> before. Uh, these magnificent men in their flying machines. I think we can replace the flying machines with phenotyping machines. But um, yes, so on a more serious note, um, coming back to drought, um, this year in Morocco, was the worst drought in, in decades. I think it's also the case in some parts of Europe. And um, yesterday, Francois pointed out that uh, the term drought is basically meaningless in describing the temporal dynamics of an ever-changing uh, water deficit. And I, and I took a, a quote uh, from Francois in 2012. He still says the same thing, which is which is quite reassuring. So um, the, any trait could eventually be useful or not useful for drought tolerance. Uh, it depends on the drought scenario um, for a given area in a given year. So it, you need to do that, um, keeping that thing in mind. So in my presentation, I'll just give you a bit of historical progression about um, water use, some of the models, the phenomenological model of Pasfura, the mechanistic description of water use, and in my point of view, what could be the realistic options to uh, improve uh, drought tolerance and what kind of tools we have developed um, that are quite relevant to the questions that we have been asking. Um, so that's not new. There were some seminal observations in the 17th century from John Woodward that water passed out of the plant leaves through little pores. I'll leave the quote. Um, th this is a very uh, interesting work. And um, later on, Briggs and Chance have used devices that we uh, still use today. Uh, I don't know if you know what these things are. These are lysimeters. We keep on, we're still using them today in a different way and in a different uh, shape. And I think Alexi has shared with me some of the devices that looked a lot like the things that we are currently developing in Morocco. So we are not reinventing anything. We're using things a bit differently. Um, so basically, there was an observation about how yield was affected by, by water use. And later on, uh, a very important work by De Witt in the Netherlands that where he took a series of experiments and he plotted uh, growth and yield uh, versus the transpiration and importantly that was normalized by an index of atmospheric humidity and you can see that this is quite well conserved in sorghum, wheat and alfalfa. Of course what changes a lot is the slope of, of these uh, graph. And I'll come back to this later on, and most importantly, to the, the, the fact that he took into account the atmospheric humidity. Later on, Pasura came up with a model that accounts for yield as a, the amount of water that has been used times the harvest index plus a term called water use efficiency that everyone knows. The problem with uh, the model of uh, the equation of, of John Pasura that is basically not a mechanistic equation. Why? Uh, because, you know, if you want to improve yield as part of water use, um, so how would you do that? Most of the people would say, 
Yes, just improve water use efficiency. But how would you improve water use efficiency? I mean, that, that is not a mechanistic way of looking at things. And the, the problem is this, the, that the dominating influence of the atmospheric humidity that was shown by the weight was not taken into account in the Passura equation. It still has lots of merits from an agronomic uh, perspective. It accounts, uh, in, it shows one thing, that a yield cannot exceed the amount of water that is available to the plant. So basically from a physical perspective, you cannot have more yield than the amount of water that is in your, in your field. Later on, um, Tom Sinclair and, and Tanner gave a more mechanistic way of looking at yield throughout this equation that um, uh, takes in, integrates yield as a function, of course, of harvest index, but brings back um, the, the vapor pressure deficit, which is the atmospheric uh, humidity, into the, the picture. And it, it also brings into the uh, equation uh, the, some coefficient that is a mechanistic coefficient that is explicitly defined by physiological properties of the crop. We'll come back to this later. So um, this is a, a very seminal and important work that you may want to examine um, and that we will be basing our talk basically on, on, on this equation because it offers uh, some insights and uh, it takes into account, as I earlier said, the vapor pressure deficit. Okay, so based on this equation, what are the realistic options from a physiological point of view uh, if we take back the Tanner and Sinclair uh, derivation of, of drought? Oops. Okay, so that's the equation again. It, it's, it takes into account harvest index, the, the coefficient K, the transpiration, the VPD, uh, of course, as a function of time. So if you act on each of these uh, variables, the harvest index, K, T, and VPD, you might have an improvement of yield at the end. And I will discuss later on how likely each one of these parameters is, um, is likely to bring any kind of improvement when it comes to, uh, to, to drought. Um, so I'll start with, with K. Um, so first thing that we, we can do is increase K. I mean, it's good in theory, but is that very simple? No, uh, it's not that simple because it's, it's actually, um, K is a, is a, is a complex uh, uh, coefficient that is highly uh, dependent on the photosynthate uh, co uh, conversion of the plant mass. So it depends on whether your crop is more of a carbohydrate crop, or a protein crop, or even a liquid, uh, a lipid type of uh, oil, oily uh, crops. <clears throat> and it depends on factors that are highly dependent on the internal versus the external carbon concentration. So yes, um, you can increase K, but it's not as simple as it, it seems. Um, it, it depends a lot uh, on, on, on the nature, as, as I earlier said, whether you have a C4, a, C, a C3 crop, or a um, and, and different natures of the crop, whether it's maize, wheat, rice, uh, and, and soybean and peanut. Um, so as I earlier said, it's unlikely in my point of view to increase K unless um, you lower the energy gain in, uh, you have a lower protein or lower lipid concentration within your crop. But normally crop species are grown for their characteristics, so going for lower proteins or um, lower uh, lipid concentration is not a viable option. I mean, you don't want um, a soybean or a lentil that, is, that has less protein. And you can also do that by changing the photosynthetic characteristics uh, of the leaf, by change, working on, on the, um, the, the carbon concentration or shifting from a C3 to C4. But it, we still, there is still a long way to go uh, th this way. So, as I said, it's somehow unlikely that we can act on, on this variable uh, because we'll have to, uh, we can do that through a decreased stomatal conductance, but with, with what comes with that is the, the slower growth of the plant. So that's K. In my point of view, it's a bit unlikely that we can act on this parameter. The other thing that we can act on, if you remember the equation, is the harvesting this. Many people would say, let's sustain the harvest index under drought, which is, I mean, it's a, 
hot debate. I'm not going to go a lot into the, the, the fact that harvest index, again, in my point of view, is not a, something that we can act for because it's um, the, the benefits from the improved uh, capacity, capability of the seed set or growth could be expected only uh, in seasons where harvest index and not yield, that's important, uh, are consistently negatively impacted with drought. So in my point of view, we, we can still have a discussion about the harvest index. We had some with Alexi a while ago, uh, but uh, I don't think that's a viable option to increase yield under drought. So the other option we have is increase the water available. So have more access, give the plant more access to water. How can you do that? Of course, you can irrigate. Uh, you can match sowing dates with phenology and rainfall patterns, which is good. That's a management option. That's not a, a genetic tweak. You can, some pretend that osmotic adjustment would, could be, would be a, a way forward, but I think that even large increases in the potential gradients results only in, in very small shifts in the increased amount of water. So osmotic adjustment has been advocated for for a long time. I don't think it is a, a viable way of, of going forward. Routing, yes, um, if you have a constant recharging of the soil, but you have to be careful but, uh, because sometimes having more rapid root growth would allow plant to use more water and therefore deplete the, the water earlier and you will have a greater early season water extraction which uh, doesn't allow the plant to go forward all the way to, um, to yield. So yes, some of the things could be uh, possible but um, not, not that much uh, margin over there. So uh, coming back to the same equation, I've discussed K, harvest index, uh, the amount of uh, transfer of water available. Remaining one is VPD. It has been neglected for a long time because it has always been considered as a, somehow an atmospheric variable that you cannot act upon, but it's not really that much of an atmospheric variable, I'll, and I'll show you that uh, later on. Because if you look at the, the VPD is the driver of the whole plant gas exchange from the internal amount of uh, water that is available within the leaf to the outside. And it is that gradient of water pressure that drives the whole transpiration. So it's not only um, an environmental variable, it's also a plant. Uh, the, the plant can have a way of on acting on this uh, variable. Uh, and I'll show you this uh, l later on, how could we could do that in different ways. So uh, if we want to uh, decrease the VPD, conserve water, we can do that uh, by doing a lower uh, hydraulic conductance under well water conditions. If you consider that a leaf cutting and, and all sorts of, of resistance everywhere, you can do that with having a lower hydraulic conductance under well water conditions. But you can also do that by limiting transpiration under high vapor pressure deficit. Typically during the day, you have, uh, so this is the time during the day and the pr vapor pressure deficit. And the vapor pressure deficit goes uh, uh, up and then down as we go in the cycle. The transpiration follows more or less the same pattern as uh, the vapor pressure deficit. So the whole idea is if we can eventually act on this point, by limiting transpiration rate at a high VPD in order to save water so water could be used later on in the, in the cycle. So that is something that uh, was looked for uh, in, in simulation studies um, on soybean. Uh, I mean, the group of, of Tom Sinclair has lo looked a lot on that and you can see that there are high uh, yield benefits, whether in the US or even in Africa uh, for higher uh, probability of having a, um, a, a higher yield if we manage to get that rate, which is the limited transpiration rate at higher uh, vapor pressure deficit. We also did that on lentil in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, this, our study shows that there are major yield benefits, whether it is on average yield or uh, the, the yield increase probability uh, in 
uh, uh, Southeast Asia, but mainly in the, the driest parts. This is the rainfall pattern of uh, the region. So the, the, the higher yield benefits are shown in the, um, in the, in the driest part. Okay, uh, and it's not just us who showed that. A recent study in, in, in Australia shows the, more or less the same thing. That's a wheat study with limited transpiration rate uh, uh, genotypes that shows a probability of a field increase uh, in, in parts of, of Australia, Queensland, and New South Wales. We also did that in a, in a closer uh, part of the world. We did the same type of simulation. Again, it's a crop modeling uh, study in, um, in Tunisia and with also genotypes that shut the, down their stomata at, at a certain level, at two kilopascals of VPD. And you can see that there's a probability of having a, a yield increase uh, specifically uh, in the drylands of Tunisia. So th those are iso heights of precipitation. And you can see that basically here, in the driest parts of Tunisia, where you would have the highest amount of uh, probability of yield increase. So those are simulation uh, studies. And I'll end up um, saying that, OK, simulation studies are good. Uh, but we need to look for phenotypes that show that type of, of response. So we have developed two uh, um, phenotyping tools to address that. And I'll speak in the last five minutes about those two phenotyping platforms. Uh, the first one is, is Phenomerzuga that we have uh, developed. And uh, the currently, we are developing uh, Phenoma, which is uh, another high throughput phenotyping platform. Those are really different in scales and objectives, because that's more of an indoor type of facility, and that is a close to field. Uh, uh, type of uh, facilities. Um, so we have Fenomerzuga is, is, a, is a small indoor facility that, um, that is shown here that we have uh, developed and that could eventually uh, simulate any kind of environment in the, uh, um, the atmospheric part on temperature, of course, relative humidity, and you can simulate v vapor pressure deficit at a 30 minute space. We did lots of engineering by looking at uh, the, 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 how to separate and untangle vapor pressure deficit from increased temperature. You can also do a dry down on the root uh, level. So you can dry down the soil in an automated way. And uh, the idea of the development of this machine that we normally uh, have been using, used so far in looking at that type of responses where you can plot vapor pressure deficit to transpiration rate, or you can check the progression of transpiration rate as the soil dries down. But none of the studies have looked into combining both, because this is what happens basically in, um, in nature. You have a dry soil more or less coming down with a, with a dry air. So um, we wanted to combine both in that type of device and generate that type of data. So what could be the progression, the differences in VPD breakpoint in that case? So the, the point that shifts the transpiration downs as the soil dries down. So we have the answer. Uh, we're preparing the paper. We, and it's quite interesting to see what's going on. The whole point of this um, uh, the phenotyping platform was to use it in more of feeding crop models, because as Francois mentioned yesterday, uh, it is designed to generate some kind of parameters that are not existing so far in crop models, but we can eventually took them out and generate type, that type of data of the, the, how would the plant react on a combination of both uh, stresses that is not currently taken into account in a crop model. So the second um, phenotyping platform is the Phenoma uh, phenotyping platform, which looks like this. It's actually located in Bengarir in Morocco, next to Marrakesh, which is a very dry area uh, with low rain and hot summer, uh, summers and springs. And it's, it, has, uh, it, it is a large uh, container lysimetric facility, and it consists of, of six... Oops, what did I do? 
Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it consists of six independent modules. So each of these modules are here. Each modules, uh, module have two robots that is equipped with weighing traits to measure transpiration at a pace of 30 minutes. It also has a rainout shelter uh, in, in completely independently. And uh, it is designed to harbor different types of soils. So we, have, we will have more or less a phosphorus-rich soil versus uh, a phosphorus-deficient one. Um, and uh, the, it has uh, two rows of lar 120 large containers. So the large containers look like, like these, which allows us to go for, for big uh, uh, evaluation, not in, in tubes. So in total, we're having 1,440 containers. Um, and underneath, we have a weighing robot that acts and could eventually um, measure, calculate the transpiration, and put back the amount of water that is transpired so we can also monitor the water use. Um, we also invested in, so this is what the, 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 the phenoma would look like. Uh, the, you should imagine the, the, the oops. You should imagine the, the containers here. And you've seen that funny machine that we have seen yesterday in many presentations. So yes, we invested in a, in a phenomobile that uh, would go on, on, on canopy scanning uh, plant, so we could measure um, at the same time while measuring plant transpiration, we could have uh, an idea about what's going on in, at the canopy level so we can have a live uh, water budget. There are lots of parameters that we would acquire and that would be interesting to look at, but this is what the uh, objective is. Um, so basically, the platform is, the construction has started. As you've seen, the robots are ready. Uh, we need some civil constructions um, that will start soon, so we expect this to be operational by December, end of this year, hopefully. Um, so I'll end up thanking our group, so the, the African Integrated Plant and Soil Research Group, uh, Professor Maiz Amri, who's my colleague, um, Hamid Zeghi, who's from MINDEC, uh, who designed with us the, the entire lysimetric robots and, and the Phenomer Zuga, and of course Tom, uh, with whom we continue collaborating. Thank you. Okay. We have time for, few, for one, or, one or two questions. It's very nice to see that uh, things progress in Morocco, so it's very good news. Um, I will certainly not argue against VPD, but transpiration uh, is uh, linked to both light and VPD, and you, you, you focus everything on VPD. <clears throat> VPD and light are often correlated, but not so correlated. Light, more often than not, has more effect than VPD. So how do you reconcile that with your theory? And uh, okay, stomatal response to VPD is important, but uh, stomatal response to light is probably equally important. Yes, um, we haven't considered that. So um, honestly, we need to look further into the light response. I don't know if you have made uh, experiments looking at the stomatal response to light and how does it is it affected by VPD? Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but uh, I expect that to be somehow correlated because you will have a, unless you have a, a high um, radiation, you might have a higher VPD. We'll discuss that. But we haven't looked into light. Okay, other questions? Okay, so my turn to present Marie Weiss. Okay, so um, uh, my talk will be about uh, using satellite remote sensing for plant phenotyping and flat, uh, plant phenotyping for satellite remote sensing. And uh, this is a work which is uh, achieved together with other members of the CAPT uh, uh, team. Okay, so everybody uh, in this room knows that uh, phenotyping allows uh, studying the gene environment interactions. And so when uh, you are doing some phenotyping experiments, uh, you have to include a variety of uh, cultivars, of treatments, 
to provide some, uh, some kind of um, uh, difference in the environment, but uh, you don't sample uh, the whole uh, environmental condition as it is at the Earth's surface, let's say. Uh, so, and especially the soil conditions and also the variety in, uh, in, uh, in climate. Uh, so it would be better to uh, multiply the site location and yes, uh, to, to, to better handle uh, the world system. Uh, here I uh, just put a, a recap uh, of all the instruments that are used uh, for plant phenotyping. So from the IoT, Manheld, Literal, and others, uh, UGV, uh, UAV, and then satellite. And uh, you can see, uh, okay, this, yeah, okay, yeah, you can see that there are differences in the spatial resolution, spatial coverage, and uh, revisit frequency mainly. And uh, well, with satellite, we degrade a lot the spatial resolution. But the advantage is that we have uh, an exhaustive sampling uh, of the uh, surface. Uh, and also, uh, while you can have, let's say, uh, uh, weekly data uh, um, using uh, UAV and UGV, uh, with satellites, it can be a few days and uh, even more. Um, so the main advantage is the special coverage and the special sampling that you can get with the satellites. Uh, so um, here I have made uh, some kind of a listing of the specificity of satellites for phenotyping. So the first one, of course, is the special resolution. So the, the, the best satellites, let's say, have uh, around the 30, cent 30 centimeter um, uh, resolution. And I extracted here um, uh, some images from a paper from uh, Zhang et al, uh, showing the degradation of the spatial resolution depending on the satellite you are using. So you can see that uh, even at four meter, you get some kind of blur, and it's quite difficult to get access to uh, uh, accurate uh, information. So the only, um, uh, let's say, the only um, quantity that uh, you can, uh, objects that you can characterize is at least a microprot or an area in the microprot, but uh, not the organ or the, or the, pl or, or the plant, in, individual plant. Uh, and also you have a cost uh, related to a very high spatial, uh, very high, I mean, for satellite remote sensing community. Uh, very, very special resolution. And also what must be taken into account when you are looking at satellite data is that uh, uh, you have some, uh, what we call the point spread function, which uh, actually um, describe the, the way the, 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 the sensor measures the surface. So at, at least at, at the, uh, within your pixel, uh, you also measure the pixels that are uh, around the, your, your own pixel. So you can see here that you get the information at least for, for this is for SkySat, so 30 centimeter resolution. So you, 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 the information in your pixel actually comes from, minor, uh, let's say, uh, 60, centimeter, 60 centimeter around your, uh, your, your pixels. So to be sure that you are measuring uh, the right thing, you need at least to have the size of your micropods three times uh, the, the pixel size of your, your satellite. So the second, uh, I, do, I don't know how, uh, I don't know how to, to, to launch my movie. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so this is, a, this is a movie from the NASA showing the, the occurrence of clouds um, at the Earth's surface. So as you can see, uh, there are some regions which are very uh, clear, but uh, when you go in the northern Europe and uh, France, for example, uh, you can get quite a lot of, uh, of clouds and during the whole, uh, the whole year. So this is the main limitation because when you have clouds, the satellite doesn't see anything except if you are using uh, radar data. Uh, so you may have sometimes two or three months of uh, missing data and generally it occurs in, print, in, in spring uh, when you need the, the information actually of the crop growth. So uh, here you have an illustration, also a study from a Laguard based on an 18-year data set in three towns uh, in, in France, Avignon, Bordeaux, and Rennes. And actually, they try to evaluate, to evaluate uh, the, the number of clear days within one period when you have a revisit of uh, one day of the satellite, satellite, two days or five days. And what you can see is that in Avignon, if you have a two-day revisit, you 
you can sample actually the, the whole cycle, but then you go to Bordeaux and you need to have a satellite passing every day. And in Rennes, it's worse. Sometimes you don't get any data, even if you pass every day. Uh, so this is a non-exhaustive list of satellites that are available and that could be used uh, for phenotyping. Uh, well, if you have sufficient, uh, this is for filter phenotyping and this is for, let's say, more uh, traditional experimental phenotyping. So you can see that you have, uh, well, uh, resolution from 30 centimeter to, let's say, 4 meter and 10 meter. And all these data are actually uh, not free, so you have to pay for them. Uh, and, and you generally what you have uh, for some of the satellites like uh, Pleiad uh, or SkySat, you have uh, tasking facilities. That means that you can order uh, some um, some visit some visit uh, on your site, and uh, you can increase in that way the the, the repeat the, the repeat cycle of uh, your the acquisition of your data. So mainly they have the same uh, spectral uh, characteristics. So this is something that Fred has uh, presented yesterday, so uh, I, I, I won't go in, in, in uh, much detail. But actually, when you are, you are processing satellite, with satellite data, this is the same as for uh, Phenomobile or UAV, UGV. You need to do some pre-processing, and then you can reach your, uh, your variable of interest, your trait of interest, um, either by uh, inverting relative transfer model or by uh, using data-driven uh, uh, approaches, machine learning, uh, but you need uh, ground measurements. So the interest with using data-driven um, uh, approaches is also that you can uh, estimate uh, the variables, uh, traits that are indirectly linked to radiative transfer, for example, uh, the nitrogen content. Okay, so I will speak a little bit about the processing steps uh, of, of satellite data and, and what it implies on, on the quality of uh, the, the, the data that you get. So first, of, of course, there is a radiometric calibration, which is done actually by, by the provider of the, of the data. And uh, so uh, this is um, uh, an illustration of the difference, for example, for example in uh, uh, spectral bands uh, in the blue here and in the near-infrared here between uh, Landsat 8 and uh, Sentinel-2. So we took some uh, images uh, uh, over crops uh, and uh, which were acquired the same day, not exactly the same hour, by, by, both, uh, by both sensors. So that means that if you want to use a constellation of satellites and you want to mix uh, data from different uh, satellites, you need to uh, harmonize and uh, the, the the, the band, the, the, the reflectance value in the different bands. Then, of course, you have the geometric processing, and so you have to, to, uh, to, to put your data in a, in a, in a map projection, and uh, this has also uh, the way it is done and uh, the way uh, when, when you get your data has also uh, an impact on, uh, on uh, your time series, and you can have, for example, uh, um, some, uh, some shift from one day to another due to the, let's say, bad geometric accuracy of your, of your data. So this is uh, um, uh, extracted from a, from a technical note on SuperDov. And as you can see, you have an accuracy of uh, five, uh, um, it's five meters uh, on uh, 3.9 uh, pixels. So that means that if you want to look at your micropods, you need to redo some uh, kind of uh, um, uh, geometric correction using ground control points on your site. So the next step, which doesn't exist for, uh, I would say, uh, ground, uh, ground or UAV uh, uh, acquisition data, is also, is, uh, of course, uh, cloud and uh, cloud shadow uh, masking. So there are traditional masking methods which are uh, employed uh, operationally uh, and uses the differences between the cloud uh, temporal and spectral uh, behaviors. And uh, recently there are some um, papers which have shown that uh, deep learning, because it's uh, segmentation problems, are, are, are working quite well. So it's not yet operational, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's coming. And uh, to show you the impact uh, of, of, of cloud, uh, so um, there is a work done in, uh, in our unit where we downloaded uh, 152 images uh, of uh, PlanetScope 
uh, over Mogio, the Mogio site. So it was in the preface experiment uh, that Raoul has uh, presented yesterday. Uh, and um, uh, the, the data are delivered with some tagged and uh, we remove the one which were uh, cloudy and uh, we get only one tagged as cloudy and we get 110 images. And as you can see, the time series is very uh, noisy, still very noisy. So we said, okay, we, we will uh, apply um, a kind of uh, filtering uh, uh, methods to get a better to detect some outliers, not, not all. And then we reduced to uh, around 100 images. And then we said it's not enough. So uh, we, we also used another quality index, which is delivered with the planescope uh, data and uh, with the thresholds. And this is the red, uh, the red curve. So the, the green one is this one, and the red curve is this one. And you see that some uh, artifacts are removed, but, but some, uh, some are still uh, remaining. And here we get from 152 images to 46 images to, to describe our, our um, uh, our cycle. So the, the second, the, the, another very uh, important pre-processing steps in satellites that you don't have with ground data is the atmospheric correction. And uh, so you have to take into account two main features in the atmosphere, the aerosol scattering, uh, for which the influence is, the, the, the influence, yes, is decreasing with the wavelengths and uh, also gas absorption, which affect actually specific wavelengths and generally the remote, the, the satellite are designed, uh, at least the bands for vegetation monitoring are designed not to be uh, affected by, by, by this uh, effect. So um, the, the correlation is, is done uh, with a uh, through atmospheric re relative transfer model and inversion and the aerosol content is derived directly from, uh, from the satellite uh, uh, blue band because this is where the atmosphere has a, a best impact, uh, the, the higher impact, sorry. And uh, you can see here uh, also a, a comparison between uh, la, uh, Sentinel-2 and uh, Let's, Landsat-8. So this is for the same day and for uh, the same, same data set as before, a number of crops. I would say there is around uh, 420 uh, 20 sites and, uh, and, and one year of data. And you can see that uh, you have a quite good correlation, but then when you do the atmospheric correction and you look at the top of canopy level, actually you degrade your, your, uh, your correlation. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the two satellites are using different algorithms. So uh, it's very important to harmonize the way you process your data to get a consistent time, time series. So and here on, uh, on the right, uh, that this is from a paper from uh, Ubok and McCabe about uh, planetscope data. Uh, after the applying the same correction and comparing planet uh, and, uh, and uh, Landsat 8, you can, you can still see some uh, discrepan discrepancy uh, on uh, NDVI. So this is on, on, on a single site, uh, single day. Uh, and all these differences are remaining because well, still there are some spectral differences, but there is also some difference in the, in the sun and uh, observation angles, and also a kind of a little non-linearity effect when you uh, uh, aggregate planet data free uh, around four meter to Landsat 8, which is 40 meter. And finally, you want uh, what I said, uh, the, your time series, so, so you need to harmonize the data, so minimizing the, the, remaining, uh, the remaining nodes, uh, and uh, you have different, uh, different ways of, uh, of, of doing that. You can do that either at the reflectance level or at the product level. Uh, here you have an example of uh, the variation of the view angle of, uh, of planet scope. Uh, so it's uh, from the same uh, same work as uh, that I showed you uh, previously, and here I just extracted a, a result of, uh, of a time series uh, nice time series processing using in red the planet scope and in blue uh, Landsat uh, Landsat 8 and the Sentinel 2. Uh, okay, so once you have your top of canopy reflectance. Uh, you can estimate two traits. So Fred has already sh shown that uh, yesterday. Uh, I will not go, go in details. Uh, and you, are, you have access to several traits, uh, which are actually uh, less less uh, 
it's a few as compared to what you can get from, uh, from phenotyping data. Okay, so you can use a relative transfer model driven approach. This was also presented by Fred. Uh, the problem is uh, you need to have a nice uh, training data set um, which is the uh, most representative as possible of your, of your the distribution of your variable and, uh, and co-distribution. And uh, so if you want to use 3D relative transfer model, which gives you um, more precise, uh, uh, more accuracy, then uh, you need to use mockups. And those mockups are existing for, I mean, uh, uh, let's say, a very uh, used uh, crop type, but uh, sometimes they are, they are missing. Uh, yes, and, and there is a presentation from uh, Ming Xiadong uh, in this session about uh, 3D RTM inversion. And also, so, uh, you can use a data-driven approach, and as Fred says, the training data is crucial. You need to well represent the case uh, in which you will um, uh, apply operationally your, your, your algorithm uh, using your remote sensing data. So how can remote sensing and phenotyping complement each other? So uh, as we have seen a lot uh, these days, uh, you can get to, 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 many, uh, to, to, to many variables uh, uh, at the plant and uh, uh, organ levels. Uh, and with, radiative to, and with uh, satellites, you can have access only to few, uh, to few variables uh, through uh, radiative transfer mo model inversion. Uh, but thanks to uh, all uh, this data, we can improve the accuracy uh, of uh, ground measurements uh, of green fraction and variables. So we get to uh, uh, actually uh, leaf for index and uh, uh, effective true value and so on. So uh, everything which is uh, linked with the, with the clumping. And the idea is that uh, you can use uh, these uh, measurements and, and these uh, better measurements uh, by using machine learning and improve also your estimates um, from remote sensing. Uh, okay, and uh, so also uh, what I said earlier, earlier the advantage the, of uh, the uh, remote sensing also complement phenotyping uh, for um, uh, complementing the environmental uh, sampling, let's say. Uh, and uh, so this is very important if you want to go from the structural traits uh, to the functional traits. And uh, this is actually the, the, the topic of the FAST approach, uh, which is a project which is beginning be between, uh, between uh, CAPT, uh, LEPS, and uh, the, the experimental unit of, uh, of INRAE. And the idea is to, uh, to use a functional plant model and to assimilate data uh, from phenotyping experiments and from commercial fields uh, with the same, uh, same cultivars uh, to, to better sample uh, the environmental um, uh, variability and uh, uh, be able to, to reach uh, functional traits. Uh, and finally, also, there is another way of uh, complementing remote sensing and, uh, and, um, and uh, let's say, phenotyping or high resolution um, uh, ground measurement is uh, to, uh, to 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 complement the dynamics of to fill the gaps uh, due to cloud occurrence for remote sensing by using by sampling uh, the, the the ground the, the ground uh, uh, locating uh, let's say uh, representative uh, pixels and then uh, use the satellite data to uh, to update the the, the level of uh, leaf array index based on the let's say um, uh, reference pixels uh, um, continuous measurements okay i come to the conclusion uh, uh, so we, with uh, remote sensing, uh, the idea for remote sensing is that you can um, improve the accuracy of, uh, of uh, your product, and for phenotyping, you can uh, extend the coverage of, uh, of your experiment. And you can also uh, 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 reach uh, functional traits. And for remote sensing data, as you have seen, there is a number of processing steps uh, which are, I mean, which have an impact of the, on, on, the, on the variable uh, you are looking at. So for phenotyping experiments, it's very important to adapt the size of the micropot to check, oops, I did the same. So which one? Okay. 
Um, okay, and uh, yes, to check the geolocation accuracy, I might make um, maybe some uh, more uh, geolocation and to harmonize your product to get nice uh, uh, time series. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. We have time for a couple of questions. You didn't have coffee this morning, I guess. So you, François. <coughs> A sort of retaliation of the question I got yesterday. <laughs> um, do you think that when progress in uh, remote sensing occur? Uh, the respective roles of uh, remote sensing and airborne uh, phenotyping will, will, will change. So perhaps uh, we will only need uh, airborne for checking models, but uh, the best part of things will happen by satellites. Is that thinkable? Uh, um, you mean you, you think that one day we will use remote no, sensing? No, no, it, it's a question. It's a question. I have no idea. But uh, ca can we see a possibility of uh, most things are done by satellites and phenotyping on soil is only for checking models or whatever? I it's a big question. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I think uh, we have to wait uh, some time. <laughs> okay. so that would be <laughs> Any other question? No? Then thank you, Marie. Maïva. So now we have a presentation from Eva Beaumont from Arvalis. So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so as uh, Michel said it, I'm uh, Maeva Beaumont, and I'm working at as a ecophysiologist in junior at the Arvalis Institute. I'm based in uh, Pau, which is southwest of France, and working uh, especially on uh, maize and sorghum. Uh, here we're going to talk about uh, identifying maize, maize genotype response to water deficit and uh, its application for farmers. Because Arvalis is an institute working for farmers, meaning that they are part of our, they are fully com <laughs> they are part of our, our direction, direct I'm sorry, my English is bad, but I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, farmers are part of our uh, direction council, so they decide what we are working on. And the questions that they are always asking are, how do I ensure my crop, my yield, beside climate change? Is there a better, a better genotype compared to another? And this is how we want to, to respond to this with phenotyping, HD phenotyping. So we think that because uh, of uh, the use of you know, HD, we are able to have a cinetic, cinetic, oh, whoa, wrong button again, cinetic data to avoid destructive and then to have further responses. We are also we we also think that we can compare uh, genotype uh, genotype behavior, of course, as we have seen it before. Um, PhenoHG can also help us to highlight relation between climate and crops that we all already don't know. And of course, we want to use this knowledge to improve our models and develop tools that we can that can help uh, the farmers. So the question that we are trying to answer there is, uh, is there a, like high type traits that can difference genotypes and we can, that we can use to find the best one? So we're going to talk here about data that are from Phenofield. I don't know if, yeah, I think some of you are used to this one. Phenofield is a phenotype tool that is based in Ouzouer uh, Le Marché. So, center of France near uh, Orléans. And uh, it is composed of uh, eight rain out uh, shelters. And uh, so we can, uh, with this thing, we can um, induce uh, drought, water deficit, at, uh, at, uh, yeah, with the scenario that we choose. 
and there is uh, eight gantry that, uh, yeah, okay, so the rainout shelters are on rails and can move to, to a position. So here you can see that uh, it was maize on uh, 2018. You can see that this position was uh, water deficient compared to this one. So yeah, the rainout shelters move and also the gantry here that we can find here. Uh, the gantry carry phenotyping boxes like those and uh, so that uh, we, we can phenotype all the, all the culture. Uh, on the phenotyping boxes, we have RGB camera, LIDAR, and spectro radiometer. Uh, for small crops like wheat, uh, barley, and oat, we can have almost 400 plots, while for a bigger one, we can have a bit less, but uh, also a huge amount. Uh, the study was part of the Caravage uh, Casdar project uh, involving uh, several, uh, several partnerships. Uh, it took place between 216 and 220, and uh, implying six partners and four species corn, sunflower, sugar beet, and nut beetroot, and pea. <laughs> the goal was to uh, increase knowledge on uh, genotype response to water deficits. <coughs> and also to develop methods and tools to predict genotypes performance into many environments. So on MACE, on those pro this project, we work on uh, Phenophile in 2018, uh, carrying 11, uh, 11, yeah, 11 corn genotype into hydric condition. Um, the two hydric conditions were this one. So you can see here the, so the relat relative soil water content and uh, here's uh, the time from sowing to, to harvest. Um, so the well water was re irrigated to maintain the relative soil water content without deficit, while the deficit one uh, wasn't irrigated until the, okay, in French we call it slag, but I think it's really typically French. <laughs> it's the limit uh, abortion of kernel stage. So we think that, uh, after this stage, there is no, 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 not, uh, no many, no, not anymore <laughs> grain abortion. So the big, uh, the big water deficit was uh, between um, mid vegetative stage and uh, and this uh, famous uh, stage. Uh, so this allowed to affect uh, yield, of course, significantly, uh, because of uh, loss of uh, grain number per meter, me square meter, while the weight of grain was not so affected. If we took the data, so yeah, I, um, I chose to focus only on uh, simple uh, phenotyping data. So green fraction seen above and uh, height seen by uh, calculated with the, with the LIDAR. Uh, this is uh, world data and we uh, fitted them with the famous FRED model on one side <laughs> and with the bilinear model on the other one, allowing us to have uh, many parameters like the slope uh, maximum value, the time to which the slope is changing, the area and other curve, uh, maximal value, value at one stage, etc., etc. That's the beauty of dynamic threat is that you can have many, many parameters to work with. Uh, as an example, here is here are two genotypes. So uh, you can see a green fraction uh, and uh, thermal times in thawing. And you can see that in when wa well water conditions, there is not, not so many differences between the two genotypes. While in uh, water deficits, we can see that uh, the first one is uh, responding differently than the second one. Firstly, the first one is uh, rapidly decreasing its growth, while the other one is maintaining its growth, resulting in uh, the first one in a big loss of uh, maximal GF value while the other one is quite, uh, quite uh, conserving uh, its, uh, its value. So we can, uh, yeah, there is kind of a ant behavior while uh, there is a cicada behavior. One is conserving its, uh, its uh, reserve while the other one is optimist and trying to, to, to work with it. Um, if we, so yeah, we can ask the question, ask the question, is there a relation between those two parameters, the GF loss and the GF speed loss? And so we have this graph here, where we can see here the GF area under the curve 
around flowering time. So I put here a little gem to try to explain it. <laughs> While here you have the rate of uh, GF growth. Um, you can see that water deficit, uh, the well-watered plants are pretty well re related. The other one too, but the relation is completely different. If we look at the, the loss of these two parameters, so the difference between well-watered and water deficit, there is also a relation, not so clear, but still one, and we think we can improve it with uh, more genotypes. Uh, we can find back our ant genotype, type here and our cicada one and statistically we can also distinguish the two the two kind of groups of behavior here so this is interesting because we we think we could use this uh, kind of behavior to to behavior to try to to know which behavior will be the most interesting to use in any uh, water deficit scenario this is a, a clue uh, yeah, we need more, more data to approve the group and their relation to the environment. But now, if we talk about the farmers, they don't really care about that. They just want to know if the yield will be maintained or not. So let's do a focus on that. If we took back our two genotypes, we can see that uh, the second one is, uh, has a higher potential in well water yield uh, due to a higher grain number. And if we look what happened in water deficits, we can see that the first genotype is maintaining its, its, uh, its grain number, even a bit higher, but is losing a lot of weight, while the other one is losing a lot of grain number, but maintaining its, uh, its, uh, weight, number, its weight, uh, grain weight. So we have two different strategies. But if we look at the yield, uh, the first one, genotype one, is apparently losing less yield than the other one. But if we look at the raw yield, the second one is still more interesting for the farmers. So we have to do a difference between the yield loss and the yield that the, that the farmers will, will sell. So yeah, we can't, we can't talk about a loss without talking about the potential. And this is what I wanted to, to highlight here. So if we look at the yield loss with water deficit uh, compared to the genotype, we can see that those ones seem to be the more resistant because they have the less loss, while those ones seem to, seem to be the more performance. It's not be, be, the, the more resistant is the number 11, but the number 11 is still not the best. So the more performance are two and four, and they are also in the more resistant ones. So maybe we can ask ourselves if these genotypes will be the more adapted to, to cope in any water deficit situation. And this is still to answer. <laughs> okay, and this is some other relation that we were able to, to see, to, to show uh, with our experiments. A good relation between yield and uh, height growth speed. So really easy to measure. You can have it in, I don't know, in a, a few few weeks, and you can see that it's yeah pretty well correlated when we are taking all the condition together. So it might be an aside to 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 uh, to model yield even in uh, in not so, so good condition. And the other good uh, nice relation that we show is a relation between grain number per square meter and maximal green fraction. So we can see that uh, the bigger the green fraction when in deficit is also the less uh, grain number per, per square meter. So yeah, two insight to, to, to model yield even in, a, in not good condition. Okay, so to conclude, you, we were able here to uh, distinguish genotype with easily phenotype traits. Like, but uh, we want to ask uh, if, um, if those traits can also be found in, uh, with other phenotype tools. So we have also experiment with other phenotyping tools to see that. Uh, we also highlight uh, constate, con contrast, blah, 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 contrasting <laughs> genotype behavior. Oh, so blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we also highlight, highlight contrasting genotype behavior with Aunt and Cigada. And we ask ourselves, uh, if they cup, will cup well in some water deficit scenario. Uh, this is to be, to be answered this year. 
and we also see that uh, combining, combining genotype resistance and performance could maybe uh, answer the question, or the, is there a, a best genotype? So this year, yeah. This year we will confirm and improve uh, the results and uh, we will um, have uh, quite, quite the same experiments but lead in uh, three environments representing five hydric condition and 60 genotypes. So we are really, yeah, we, we want the result. And we will also use the new phenotyping machine called Phoebe that you can see here. It's uh, based uh, in uh, Southwest in Pau, Montardon. And uh, it's a basic uh, engine tractor, uh, which was adapted to phototype, uh, phenotype, sorry, uh, culture up to three meter high, so maize and sorghum are easy to, to phenotype with it. And in the phenotyping box, there is a LIDAR, RGB camera, and uh, spectroradiometers. Uh, yeah, the new baby. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, my question is when you mention green area or uh, it's leaves or it's standing leaves. Is it like total green area? It's, it's total for now. It's a gr yeah, total fraction of green. But we are also able, thanks to LIDAR, to, but it's not uh, yet uh, formalized, but uh, it's, uh, we are able to, to do green area index and uh, leaf area index too. Okay. Did you analyze this thing in terms then in what's leaf area location, what's the stem location, and how it would change in the balance in terms of transpiration capacity and how it would help to explain yeah. the traits of like stability uh, and higher yield on mm. the water deficit? Yeah, I didn't yet, but uh, yeah, I was quite inspired by your presentation, so I, I have to, yeah, okay. I will do it. No, it's just, uh, uh, I'm trying something very similar, uh, okay. and that's why uh, okay. my question. And, nice. Okay, thank you. Yes, or no? <coughs> thank you. Uh, for uh, you, you said the next steps are five hydric uh, conditions, yeah. and I was wondering. Uh, you have a very nice system with a lot of uh, countries. Uh, we tend to ad address it as pretty binary, drought or not. And you showed in your okay. big genotype advantage, like having more or less seeds seems pretty dramatic. And when you would include a later stage, a little bit additional irrigation would tremendously change your results mm. because if what you conclude that we look at yield for farmers but if you have seeds remaining eh, seed number remains but the other genotype you know, uh, decreases seed number is pretty drastic then there's no later irrigation no improvement possible anymore whereas if you're a thousand kernel weight i could imagine if you have recovery this is still uh, potential to recover your yield so you would get a complete difference so the question is your five hydric conditions in the future do they uh, include dynamic changes of water over time. Uh, yeah, um, so five hydric foundation was quite, uh, it was more like well, uh, some of, yeah. So in the three environment, one will be drought and irrigated, the same scenario as before. Uh, the other environment too, but we don't control the drought since it's uh, Lyon and there is no rain out shelter, so we'll see what's going on. And the same in uh, Montardon, Po, which is a uh, uh, high level of, uh, yeah, there is no water deficit in Po, in south of west of France. So we, but it's also, will be different. It's more like, we'll see what's going on and uh, have the scenario thanks to that. <laughs> but I think in Lyon, the drought will be later than in, uh, than in Fenoux field. So to, to drought them, yeah. Other questions? If not, I have a question for you, uh, Marie. In your two genotypes, I mean, following the, the question that has been asked before, uh, do you plan on looking at the transpiration rate? Because they seem obviously to have extremely different strategies in terms of yeah. um, reducing their leaf area, and I, I'm assuming there's a reduction in leaf area, and therefore maybe in transpiration. Yeah, I like to, but I still don't know how because. Uh, it's easy. Yeah. Okay. Even in in field like that. No, in field. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit tricky. Uh, but we can yeah, we, but we can do dry downs yeah. in in but big I, pots. But I I I I like to because we talked about it yesterday and yeah. we yeah we'll have to 
to try to, to, to go deeper into those uh, ecophysiology measurements with, the, with those, yeah. Because you can, you can assume that these are conserving water at the beginning mm. to use it later on, but that's yeah, only sure. an, an yeah. assumption unless you have proven it. Any other questions before we go on to a registered talk from Scott Chapman from the University of Queensland? We're on time, so we will have our coffee break on time. And, and maybe, hopefully, more questions in the second part of the session. Est-ce qu'on peut lancer... Est-ce qu'on peut lancer la présentation C'est bon. Well, you go ahead and go. Sorry to miss you there. Well, I'm lucky I didn't have last time. I was on the weekend and I would have had it on the phone. And they probably no, wouldn't have detected no. it. So, unfortunately, I would have been in lockdown in Avignon. Anyway, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I want to talk about integration of data across scales to predict genotype performance in national variety trials. I'm going to focus on the big font, not the little font. And hopefully Fred uh, Van Awick will talk a little bit about that later. The two projects that I want to talk about are firstly the Invita project, which is this uh, GRDC funded project that runs over the top of our international variety trials for Australia. I'll talk about a bit more of that later. And the focus there is to look at outcomes for better trial quality, uh, working out the value of phenotyping and augmenting performance prediction with environment data. And partners include marketing and CSIRO. And in that work, we're measuring at lots of scales and we're starting to combine that with the simulation to look at regional prediction. The other project that I'm looking at is the AGF EML, the Ag Feature Extraction Machine Learning, a bit of an awkward title. But this is the project we've been doing in conjunction with Arvelis, INRA and uh, HIFEN to some extent and the University of Tokyo. And our focus has mostly been on looking at head counting and sorghum, but we've also been looking at using that in wheat. And um, I think that Benoit would have talked about semantic segmentation yesterday, which you know, all of that work was done with the Avalis team. And we're looking to see if we can leverage some of that for the same types of outcomes that, that uh, Avalis are looking for in, in France. So in all of this work, we're using crop model frameworks to inform improved prediction. And here we're trying to work out ways at a, at a national scale with hundreds of trials. How do we guide the environment sampling? How do we do trait computation that can augment at the trial and the plot level? And I'll, I'll talk those through in, in, during this um, presentation. The uh, INVITA project is a five-year project that complements the EU INVITE project, which a few people might have heard about. And yes, we did steal the name from INVITE and change the E to an A uh, for Europe to Australia. And we've got a little bit more focus in our project. Uh, it's more about data augmentation, analytics and simulations. There's a few other work packages in INVITE beyond these two on HCP tools and predictive modelling that we're not doing in our project. Uh, if you want to know more about the National Variety Trials, GRDC have a website that describes those. Uh, a lot of that data is presented on that website. Uh, although if you want to use it, you do need to get permission to do so. And in Invita, the main things that we're doing is putting some extra trials on top. So we're co-locating these trials as calibrations, the BioCal trials. And then we're doing extra measurements on the NVT with UAV photos, etc., And there are reference trials. Uh, we have about three sites that we're doing deep phenotyping for those. And in VITA, our main goals are looking at trial quality and effective phenotyping and hence prediction. So I'm gonna talk in these three sections. Um, one about the trial environment, how we augment that data, plot data, how we're augmenting that and a little bit about analytics, but not a lot of detail. Uh, I really wanted to give you an overview of a national scale kind of project and some of the opportunities that 
might even be provided if, if other people want to in this uh, forum want to engage with us uh, and certainly with the invite project we're looking to develop these ideas. So for the trial uh, environment component, here's an example of an inviter NVT site. So this site's about uh, 100 kilometres west of Toowoomba, which is where I live these days in southeast Queensland. And here we've got um, three types of trials. Here's the NVT trial itself. So it's a variety trial with three um, blocks in it, three replicate blocks and about 30 or 40 varieties. Um, in 2020, we actually established this SATCAL trial, which was a single variety and a big block. We only did that for a year because it wasn't as useful as we hoped it would be. And we thought we can use the whole trial as that estimate of the, for the SATCAL um, data. For BioCal, that's got extra genotype by density interactions in it. And we do some sampling on those. Uh, we do some growth stage measurements, not in great detail. They're only going to be sort of three to five observations per season. Uh, we do additional measures on the NVT, plot photos, screen seeker, harvest index cuts, and across the whole site. And there are usually other um, crops planted at these sites. Uh, we do four UAV flights, and sometimes we've got about 30 day frequency high res satellites and about 10 days for Planet and Sentinel. For all these trials, we've got, uh, these are at about 30 to 50 sites. So for the continuous satellites, you've got planet at three meter, Sentinel-2 at 10, Landsat at 30, different numbers of bands, different frequencies. And here you can see, uh, we actually ask the um, field technicians to walk around with a, a mobile phone to identify the trial. And that's just so that we get that first cut at being able to um, task satellites and things for, for the data sets. Um, we know it's not precise. We can get the precision after we get any UAV data back. So these are the kinds of data you might get from a, a single site in 2020. Um, indices computed from standard satellite data. Um, you can see the sowing date and the finishing date. So we're using these large data sets and we're considering the trial as one sample of wheat, for example. Um, we're able to use a lot of these different crops um, also for training our other models that we're working on for crop detection and, and so on. Uh, obviously, we utilise some other technologies that developed it at the CAP team. Um, one of them is to use this field camera that's mounted at 45 degrees in about 40 sites. We have these cameras. And that camera is taking a, a photo of the plots um, at 45 degrees. And we're able to extract out the F cover from that. And for the 2020, this is a 2020 result, actually not 2021. Um, this is the sequence that we got and some validation against drone images. And at the time, we didn't have all of that data sorted out. So we're, we're doing a more comprehensive validation of that. And of course, then we take that um, for that reference plot. So this is only one genotype per, per trial um, using the methods that, that Fred mentioned yesterday, uh, computing green area index from that um, uh, binary image analysis. And you can see here the blue points, uh, which are the first photo. We take about five photos a day and we upload those on uh, 3G or 4G to our database and automatically process it. And these, the, 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 in the photos that we take in the morning are better quality than the ones that are later in the day. Of course, we use, we've made great use of the um, results of the global wheat head data set, which Etienne talked about in detail yesterday, and is now up to 300K of, of images. This has been a wonderful um, thing to put out there. And I think Etienne emphasized this yesterday. This has been a great way to engage um, IT, computing and engineering into agriculture because 
I think around 35 of those 50 citations are in IT and computing, not in agriculture, and there's been more than 1,500 downloads. So um, Etienne is looking forward to being a highly cited author in his first uh, couple of papers, I think. So when we take the images from those cameras, we're also running them through with the pretty basic RC and N model that was developed on that data set and again explained well yesterday. And Chris um, James, who's working on a 3D modeling PhD, in which case I'll really want him to come over and, and visit with the CAP team. And um, he um, ran the standard model through. We know it's not running perfectly here, but it's running pretty well. We've tested on a large number of environments. There's 40 of these cameras in very diverse conditions. And you can see we get some spurious results, but if we were able to estimate the turn in this um, data, we'd be able to see pretty well when that um, Zadox 55 is coming up. And that would help people plan visit the field. And here's some examples for a couple of other sites, and it works pretty well. And the last part of the trial level that we're working on is using crop simulation models to get uh, stress indices. And we've tested across six years of, of trials, and these are thousands of observations of, of flowering date. Uh, we've been able to calibrate the APSIM model to estimate flowering date of all the cultivars in all the trials uh, quite well. You can see the vast majority of these predictions are within a couple of days. Um, these outliers, that's a low frequency, this is the number of observations. So these are only one to five observations out of tens of thousands that are not precise. Um, and we, we can use, when you do it at the trial level, it gives you a very accurate estimate of flowering date. So Retrospectively, we can use the weather data to identify the flowering date in the trial, and that way we can look at stress indices and things that occur. Uh, the way we're setting this up at the moment is we're actually using a pretty blunt instrument, uh, running simulations with water content profiles that vary to try to work out what's the soil water at sowing. Um, and because we can't measure it in every site, we have to really Estimated. And when we take those biomass samples we talked about across a few of these sites, um, these are settings we can get where we've set a, a soil water content for each of these different sites um, that optimizes the, the fit between the observed and simulated biomass. So it's a way of helping us try to set the soil water. And what we want to do is improve that so that we use the GAI and also the canopy temperature to try to better tune those simulations. And we're still working on the methodology for that. So that's the trial environment. Um, and for each trial, we're augmenting trial data through weather, uh, vegetation indices, um, imputed soil capacity and status, uh, reference plot phenology, F cover, GAI, and headcounts, and these crop simulations of all of these indices. Now we talk about the plot data and how we augment that. Uh, we're taking a lot of data via UAV, and you can see this screenshot from Hyphen's uh, system, where you're getting approximately two centimeter resolution images of these plots, which are, are grown. You can see they're grown in farmers' fields, so there's an area marked out in the, inside the field. And in 2020, we did about 400 flights in 2021. At least 300 flights are being processed, uh, probably heading towards four or 500. Um, it's commercial processing, and the main things that we've been retrieving from HIFEN are the crop cover height and green area index. Uh, with the multispectral analyses, of course, we're trying to get those other indices that will be discussed in, in various presentations here. And we've got this data on a range of genotypes now um, and combinations of, these are not intercrops, they're just crops that are co-located and it gives you an idea of how many mosaics we've got. 
for plot cover. We also do a pretty, we've got a very large data set of mobile phone photos with almost no control. Um, and we found um, Swanee Grunfeld who did this work, she, she took several images from each of these sites and there's hundreds of sites. And she trained up the binary um, model, the uh, decision tree model developed by Wei Gao. Um, and we're able to find it works pretty well with a big diversity of soil types and, and settings and whatever. <clears throat> so we found this system to work quite well. And it's very robust. Um, when you go through the imagery, it looks pretty good. Um, it's a simple method, but it works nicely. And as I said, we've got about 130,000 photos in 2020 and about the same in 2021. We've run the auto detection of head appearance as well. And you can see here are some box plots of these. Now, we have a lot of work to do to see how robust this is because these are box plots for a trial for a head count taken um, just after heading and, and just before um, maturity. But we don't know how accurate these are at the moment. And this, this is just simply testing whether the algorithms were doing anything and whether they were returning lots of zeros or not. But we're working on that, obviously. Um, it'd be nice if we could get this working reasonably well because one of the feedbacks we had when we talked to people about tools like the Littoral, which is a wonderful piece of technology, um, an issue for us is that our trials are so remote that the trial service providers who measure them have to travel for 200 kilometres sometimes to go and measure a trial. And they really don't want to spend much time in the trial. And so our protocol of taking three photos in a plot and then a photo of the sky and then walking down the field and doing that, taking two photos of the sky at the end and then turn around and come back, um, was very fast and very efficient, even if not so precise. So this is where we need to work out what the value might be of, of these um, approaches. Um, I did want to mention a little bit of other work from the machine learning project. I think you've already heard enough about the idea of, of GAN, um, where you take a content image and you apply a style and turn it into something else. So we start. Using that fairly early in that project, um, certainly in conjunction with discussions with Arbalest and also with uh, another project we have with Purdue. And we took a lot of sorghum photos. And if you combine them with some, some real UQ photos, with some real Purdue photos in again, a cycle GAN approach, what you do is produce these synthetic photos where um, you've got this UQ photo, but with the style of a, a Purdue image in a, in a different environment. And this is amazingly um, efficient. Chris James has done some really nice work to augment this. So we got the cycle again working. Um, and then he also built this label refinement pipeline. And, and to do this, he selected heads and backgrounds. So he took a lot of random samples of these, extracted all these patches out to make it a data set, and then ran a classifier to classify heads and non-heads. And what that let him do was to then take the cut GAN um, model um, so when he was doing his application of the GAN, we pre-trained it, you run it and there are errors in the system. But what we could do is remove the overlapping predictions and then we've got the original labels here, but we can apply this um, binary classifier to get rid of the errors. And so what it does is it, it basically it automatically corrects the, the errors in the system and then we can recycle that back into the GAN. And, and improve it further. And it's worked really nicely for a crop like sorghum. And you can see here that we get the precision. This is, these are errors from about 50 images, uh, sorry, 50 heads in an image. So they undercount by two or three heads. Uh, but if you look at when we use the synthetic GAN images, it doesn't matter if you use 600 in your training set or 100 in your training set, you get this huge improvement. Whereas if you use just original images and try to train on the diversity, it's very hard to, 
improve it even when you put lots of images into the analysis. So we've actually been mucking around with this in a real-time machine learning camera using this $150 camera that you can buy off the internet. Um, thanks to Etienne for pointing us at that at some point. And we've actually been testing this in the field and um, we've got it running and we're looking at ways that we might utilize it for, for scouting. The last point in the, in the plot level work is that we are also interested in how can we um, use task satellite imagery and um, identify variability at the at the plot level. So can we, with these 0.5 meter resolution satellites, can we understand what's going on at the plot level? Um, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in the next um, section. But really all we were doing here was taking the continuous data from NBT and planet, sorry, from Sentinel-2 and Planet and comparing it to these high resolution captures and finding that they, they do align pretty well, at least for NDVI. So for the plot data, we've got six years worth of data where we've aligned all of these historical imagery at different resolutions to the plot layouts. For two years, we've got about UAV data for up to 80 sites and about 40 sites where we have a lot of density. Uh, additional data taken in the trials, uh, we can estimate flaring date and staging. Um, and we've got high res satellite for most of these sites as well. Uh, and stages and plot photos that are a subset of sites. So just to mention a little bit about analytics and opportunities. As I said, we are using crop models to inform a lot of this. I'm not going to go through the spaghetti model that I designed with a, a graph function in R, but we use this to guide our environment sampling and, and try to think about what are the best ways to measure environment phenology development and efficiency and partitioning and, and set these experiments up to, to understand better how varieties perform differently. And this is another little graphic that was produced by Dan Smith, a PhD student uh, working with me. And I mentioned that the second type of trial that we were doing in Envino was a reference trial. And this is where we're doing highly intensive phenotyping. So we're using the Gecko tractor. Um, it's a ground-based platform, actually. The Gecko carries everything in front, not behind the tractor. Um, but it's taking hyperspectral LIDAR and, and photos. And we're trying to combine that data with environment information, phenology, mapping, and physical measurements. So these are biomass samples for um, the BioCal trials. Um, put that through spatial analysis, which Fred's going to, Fred Manawick is going to talk about. And then we've looked at some prediction models for block biomass. Bernie talked about using LIDAR, which works quite well. Um, we've also just looked at these different indices and we're also looking at indirect methods. So the types of methods that, that um, Fred Barre has talked about using crop models to try and estimate or light interception plus crop growth models to try and estimate things like biomass. Um, and certainly for biomass in, in wheat, you can do a reasonably good job of it, whether you do it direct or indirect. Um, but have we got enough precision to do that for estimating performance in, in regional prediction? sure yet. I won't spend any time on, on this slide. I'm sure Fred's going to talk about it. Um, uh, looking at how we use UAV ground cover and, and analyze variability in ground cover and how that relates to yield. Um, certainly one thing we should think about is when we take early season measures of ground cover in Australia, one of the things we want to do is decide if that information is useful um, throughout the country. Um, but it's not always positively correlated with the spatial variability in yield. And that's an important point to, to recognize. So sometimes you'll see these negative correlations between the variability of ground cover and the variability of yield. And those come about because um, sometimes crops that grow too fast too early in the season 
we'll run out of water in the environments and so that will set them back. Um, another thing that we've done is, is co-aligned um, these different satellites as well as the UAV data and this is now just simply a challenge uh, for Fred and Fred Van Ewick and his team is to say we've constructed about 100 of these multi-scale data sets and we want to see whether we can see we can determine the, the plot level uh, measurements of UAV from some of these other satellites at different scales and we don't know whether we're going to be using some hybrid of spatial and machine learning approaches to try and do that or whether it's even possible but we've been Uh, the last two slides I wanted to mention were one on uh, simulation of HTP, high throughput phenotyping. So this is some work from Sophie Chen, which is fairly similar to the type of work that you would have seen with um, that Fred Barre talked about yesterday, where we're using AppSim um, as a, a model to generate leaf area index, uh, running that through a reflectance model. Uh, and then using machine learning to invert that. And these are some of the results from Sophie's thesis, which she's in the process of publishing. The black lines are actually different genotypes and management, uh, nitrogen and irrigation. Um, and the blue and the reds are her recovered uh, leaf area index from um, spectral data in, in the simulations. The last point, and this is sort of where we'd love to get to, is using simulation to test environment characterization prediction. And this is some nice work of Daniela Bustos Quartz that was done in in silico plants. And in this kind of work, um, we took a series of uh, locations, this is about 600 kilometers by 200 kilometers, and we ran a completely synthetic experiment, um, similar to the types of things that Francois discussed. We did that over multiple years, and we looked at the winning genotypes in the mild years and the hot years. So Daniela did some classification to classify the different types. And then we looked at different phenologies that would fit and adapt across um, those spaces. So this starts to give us some kind of um, interpolation from points at which we've done simulations to other parts of the, the climate and soil um, dynamic that might help farmers make decisions about which genotype to grow where. And that's where we'd really like to get to. So that's all I was going to say about that. Um, I want to thank uh, our trial service providers who do a lot of the measurements in these trials and a lot of people at UQ, CSIRO, Bargaining, and University of Tokyo and Arbalus who worked in these two projects. And finally, um, here's some more details of some other work, uh, some other descriptions and more detailed descriptions of this work uh, for um, a street art picture that was supposed to represent my data sets. And I don't know whether the complexity, beauty or otherwise adjective of that mural, which was created by Madeline Holt, um, if that represents what's in my head, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But thanks for your attention. So is, is Scott connected? Uh, no. Anyhow, yes, he's connected. Thank you for the. While Scott's rabbit was having coffee, we were not having coffee. Uh, so questions for Scott? Yeah. No. Okay. No, oh, it must sorry. be time for coffee. <laughs> People were eager to have coffee. So we'll break for coffee and we'll have some, um, you can also have, uh, have some Scott on your side, uh, on your end of the world and uh, with the rabbit if you want. The, the next speak is um, by Andreas Hunt and uh, there is a mistake in the, the program, so it's a mysterious topic that Andreas will uh, present. So yes, I'm actually not from the University of Bonn, um, having the BreedFace platform, but from ATH Zurich, having the so-called FIP platform. And if you have seen the previous talk of Scott, you have to now go in the different dimension. So coming from a whole continent where you can do breeders' trials, imaging with satellites, we are now going 
to a platform where we're just trying to go the opposite direction, going just probably more to the individual plant. And um, I chose this new title, actually, um, as assessing the seasonal dynamics in weather responsiveness of crops, and that's really what we try to do. I would say it's uh, a lot of basic research which we are trying to do and um, also quite challenging. What we have set up is this so-called spider can platform. We call it FIP, Field Imaging Platform. And uh, we have grown the Gabi panel from Germany for quite a while in the platform. Um, this is roughly two replications of 200, uh, 350 genotypes. And we did continuous phenotyping, and you will see in a minute what we mean with that. So we have four years of data of that platform. <clears throat> and um, the basic philosophy about that is to know a little bit the climate which you have. I go into that in a minute. And try to uh, understand a little bit how these changes in the climatic conditions during diseases are actually factoring in on the yield components, and you probably all know the yield components of wheat. I'm not going into detail here, but this is, and you all know these also, these are the high throughput traits. For example, you can use canopy cover development over the season, um, measure it quite a lot of time. You can here see the little ticks. You can measure the height development and the senescence, always with different types of sensors, more and more now with RGB imaging. Um, actually, the climate normals of, um, of Switzerland are, um, this is Zurich, are here. So you actually, I just counted the numbers of days with hours below a certain threshold temperature, focusing on four degrees and 30 um, one degree is extreme, so you can nicely see that the Swiss breeders are actually squeezing in their varieties into this sweet spot where there is no stress happening. And our question is, is what can we do to push, or can we actually push these crops out of the comfort zone, uh, maybe even keeping this uh, stem elongation, which is a critical thing, at the right place. So, this is the same thing again, and I realize it's not the right presentation, but anyway, I get, try to go through that. Um, <laughs> um, so, here, I have to go back. We are just going in a sequence of, of a lot of different um, steps in modeling, and probably Fred van Oevig will tell about all these modeling steps in detail, going from the experiment design to the trade prediction in the end. And uh, what you actually, what I try to focus on now is on this dynamic development which we did. Um, you have seen many talks here about feature extraction, that means how to get the traits out of the images. We do a lot of work on that, but um, now at the moment, I try to take for granted that uh, you have seen quite a lot on that issues at the moment, and we are looking at this dynamic stuff. So when you're talking about dynamic, we have kind of a yeah, concept to dissect these dynamics into three intermediate trait categories. Um, the most obvious one is the timing of key stages. That means when does a process start and when does it end? And uh, the second is what are the quantities at defined time points? That means what is the value at the start? What is the value at the end of the process? But maybe also in between uh, the average slope and the area under the curve. And these actually should be blue, uh, these two things here. Um, but what I would like to also highlight is actually how well do these covariates describe the velocity, these ups and downs here in this dynamic process. So this is the other uh, thing we are quite looking at. And then another question again is what actually happens um, if there is some complete stop in growth dynamics? Does that affect 
of the ranking of the different genotypes. So this is a little bit pro, uh, work in progress which we do. And now I'm um, looking forward to the next slide because I changed them quite a bit. So, um, Starting with this canopy cover development, we actually um, can ask the question, what is happening? And this is data from 2016, so you have this dynamic development over time, and you actually um, can ask the question, what happens during that time? What is this dip hit here? What is happening during that phase where this phenotypic variation, this is just phenotypic data from these plots, is varying most, and what is the slope here, what is the difference here, and so on and so forth. Um, we try to do that by working with the FIP, that means with this device, where the sensor head can be really placed on this area on each individual plot, but in parallel, we also flew with the drone. That means flying with this, uh, Drone gave us this type of images, and um, using the FIP was giving us, uh, let's go back, kind of a very close canopy segmentation. And actually, most of the work here is, uh, was done by Lucas Roth, who was uh, showing you this data. So the next thing what we did is um, looking at the height development, that means we were uh, actually following height with different means, with the laser scanner and with drones. You can do that with both. This is an example from the laser scanner. And um, actually, yeah, this is not height development, but this is a canopy cover development. I'm sorry for that. Um, an example from this field phenotyping platform where we actually have these uh, images. And what we saw was that actually two genotypes, ARENA and CHOMO, are different and there is a dip. That means if I go back, it's the question what ha actually happens here at that moment. So we realized that 2016 that there was a dip here. And then when looking at this data again, we realized that some genotypes are actually, when they are coming somehow out of winter, they are having a reduction in the upper and leaf area. And we believe that this is a, something which is happening after a cold spell in winter or when it's getting very cold in winter, that actually the plants lose green leaf area. And uh, you have here arena is a winter type. This is Chomo, which is a spring type, a facultative wheat type. In um, the wheat breeders in Switzerland, they are using more and more spring types grown over winter. And you can see regularly in the spring types that you have this dip. And um, now we are going into the height development. <coughs> Here we can use, sorry, the uh, height development by, by means of LIDAR. And you can use height development by means of structure from motion. And again, we have here a very dense um, development or very dense flights. So we have many, many points. Now the question is, uh, what are we making out of these many, many flights? And this is tying, tying in now in trying to analyze what is the differences in the temporal dynamic of this plant height. So we are now actually the here in these dose response curves. And um, we try to understand what actually is driving that. And we early on, not only for early canopy cover development, but also for height, we saw that just visual inspection, um, that there is an up and down of temperature during the season. So this kind of temperature measured in the different intervals when we were doing also our flights. So we have here the data of the flights, the stem elongation rates. So not the height itself, but the rates between two different intervals. And the rates are following actually the temperature. So it's kind of probably following a lot of other things like soil water potential, maybe VPD. But the obvious, most obvious thing was temperature. So we tried to model actually this response to temperature. And what we did there was actually we sorted out this linear phase between the two points the start and the end of stem elongation in order to 
find out um, or get, get a kind of a more uh, straight development between which we think that everything which is modified there is something which can be affected by, for example, temperature. So trying to be really in the, in the face of stem elongation. And what Lucas Roth was then doing, he was actually um, using dense data of the covariate, that means of temperature here, uh, to combine that with a maximum likelihood approximation. And by doing that, we were actually um, fitting not a linear model because we were thinking that our stem elongation phase is actually the plants during stem elongation not see not only see temperatures which are in the range where there is a linear response to temperature, but they are already in the phase where there is uh, an optimum temperature reached. We are not believing that we are having any temperature in that range where actually stem elongation is hampered by supra-optimum temperatures. That we means we are fitting these models and that worked quite well. So here, this is actually the temperature in three seasons during the stem elongation rate once um, measured every three days, so the every three day means, and you can see that these temperatures range between about 4 and 18 degrees. If you take the hourly temperatures during that phase, you can see that there is much more variation from 0 to 24 degrees. And um, this is consistent, and now we took actually cardinal temperatures from this publication. Uh, Francois, I do know that there are other cardinal temperatures which are published by your group, but we are taking the more conservative ones because we believe that actually, based on this information, um, the optimum temperature is already reached um, quite a lot of times. That means we are doing the causal, causal thing. In former papers, we are just assuming a linear relationship, but I believe that maybe this asymptotic relationship is the key. And now we are going a little bit in the data. So I have actually picked for you the start and the stop of stem elongation. You can actually see uh, here, these are groups of genotypes which were bred in different regions of Europe. You can see, for example, the Swiss, they stick out because they are starting very early and they stop very early. And the French varieties, or even the British varieties, they are actually late starters for the start of stem elongation. But more interesting is this picture down there and in the, um, where you can see that the Swiss varieties are actually requiring quite some temperature, some base temperatures until they start with their stem elongation phase. Whilst the British varieties, uh, for example, they start at lower temperatures. There's only 0.5 degree differences for the, for the mean of this, this regional adaptation. But it's really clustering, it's really also significant. The differences of these models are significant. Now the big question is what is actually behind this information? What is actually driving it? Can we use that for adapting the crops to the different regions? And this, of course, is uh, work in progress. But you can see that these temperatures, the maximum growth rate, the minimum temperature, where it starts, and also the shape of these curves are heritable and across years. So this is actually four years data, the heritability across four years data. And you can see that these kind of traits which you pull out of that are heritable. And the other point is they are uncorrelated more or less. So there is no correlation between the parameters which you pull out. They're independently inherited. So this is what I wanted to show here. Along the same lines, but a different way of parameterizing that, that's actually the way actually of thinking um, Fred van Oewig is having. We are trying, and I'm sorry, this should be animated, but it's not. So <coughs> behind here you can see the um, stem elongation, and you can see that actually the velocity of this is, yeah, it's probably useless to show it like this. Um, the growth rate, these are the growth, no, I can't show it. The growth rates um, during a cold spell, and you can see that during the growth rate, at the beginning of the cold spell, the growth rate really increased, and the Swiss varieties are amongst the, the, the early ones, and then they drop 
a lot, and the Swiss varieties are amongst the later ones. Towards the end of this whole process, we are looking also at um, senescence. And um, <clears throat> that was done by work with Jonas Anderek. And you, had, you can see that we are following the senescence phase. We try to uh, fit this machine learning some, some models using the whole spectrum and using that in a, in a decent way. But we found that actually the most robust uh, measure across years is still a simple index. And we are not using a simple index at time, but we use it as a dynamic index. That means actually everything is scaled at, uh, at here 10, at, at unity, at the beginning. So we are kind of trying to get rid of all these structural um, factors, because the only thing what we try to, to find out is when is the visual and the index senescence matching most, so that we can actually have something which is matching the visual index. You can see that actually the canopy structure is changing a lot. This is a point sensor which we use here, and a lot of that stuff which we see in the index which we can train is really following canopy structure. And that's why I'm also looking forward to have devices like the Literal or our new devices which we develop in the platform to actually follow Leaf and ear senescent and left, not something else. Well, quickly, we have also looked in thermography um, where we combine, try, where we see that actually the trait is not so extremely heritable, particularly when we are using it during this phase before the senescence kicks in. We are just trying to use the trait as kind of a transpiration rate between flowering and the start of senescence and try to use the, then the trends. So these are corrected values and uncorrected values with the spots um, method. So here, these are the temporal values after the whole population has flowered and before it actually goes into um, the rapid senescence phase. So everything here could be high throughput. Um, this is actually not yet high throughput. And the problem is that actually Temperature is related to a lot of things which we probably as breeders do not want to tackle. Final height, the biomass. We would like to pair the same the genotype with the same biomass for transpiration and not um, trying to select biomass by an index which is not used for that. And that's why we try to get some, some dynamic traits in. That means I have to take some time to explain that. So we have kind of temperature of two genotypes which are fairly similar, but in relationship to the overall temperature in the population, one is increasing in rank, that means get hotter, that's a, a skeptical genotype, and the one, other one is dropping in rank, so it is actually more resistant, so to say, or keeps cooler. And if you combine that with uh, the green leaf area index with a vegetation index, you can, for example, say, okay, a genotype can increase in rank for the green leaf area, that means it keeps a green leaf area, stay green, and also keeps cool. That means it has a functional stay green, whilst if temperature is not following this, it gets hotter, then you have a non-functional stay green. We tried to do that actually with some of our genotypes, which we used as checks, and it somehow works. So Soretta, for example, is a variety which has shallow rooting, whereas Claro has deep rooting. And amongst the Swiss genotypes, the tools are clearly different, namely that the Soretta has a comparatively strong progress in um, canopy temperature. You can see there's a third variety which is very well known in Switzerland, which is complete a mess. It has very low and very high values from the start, so compared to all the other varieties, that less canopy in the field, um, being early, and so on and so forth. So we can try to use that information and finally, we can try to assemble everything into a big picture. That's what we are just doing now. So using all these parameterized values to assemble that in a big picture. And this is already the end of my talk. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys, you messed really up my talk. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I think that, ah, thank you for.
Francois, thank you for being here. You, you need a question. <laughs> um, if the response to temperature depends on genotypes, then we have a trouble for calculating thermal time. Which, Again, what? Uh, sorry? If what? If, the, if each genotype has a different response to temperature, then we have a thermal time that differs between genotypes, and we are in trouble because uh, we cannot have a single axis. So my, my way to consider that uh, was to distinguish the response to temperature during the night, in which you have no effect of VPD, and during the day, in which you have an effect of VPD. So basically, you have a positive effect of temperature and a negative effect of uh, VPD. So you can have all sorts of uh, combinations. I, I, in my hands, the response to temperature is not uh, variable between genotypes, but the response to VPD is. So if you like, we can, we can try to see whether uh, this fits with your data. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, probably one of the answers we had yesterday to where is the value of an indoor platform because we do know that what we do, I mean, we try to mimic your approach knowing that actually we do not have the span of temperatures um, in the range and knowing that we do have actually a confounding of soil water content, of VPD, of, temp of, of light, of everything. So, I mean, this is the most simple approach we do knowing yeah. that actually there's a lot of questions behind it. And I think we are just starting to, to, to try to evaluate, evaluate the data. But the good thing is, even without considering it, the different components are actually, first of all, independent. That means they are not confounded with each other. And second, there is apparently differences for, about, of genotypes amongst that. That means the second question to ask is now, is that more related, as you say, maybe to VPD, maybe to other covariates which you have during the season, or is it really temperature? I would not claim that it's really temperature. We say it, but probably you have to be more careful than that. It's true. <clears throat> okay. Was there a question? No. So we can go to the next one. I think it's a remote one uh, from Ming Xiadong, on, uh, Ming Xiadong sorry, from the Nanjing University. And she will speak about monitoring wheat with uh, satellites. Hello everyone, my name is Ming Xiadong and uh, I come from Nanjing Agriculture University in China. I'm in the first year of PhD and uh, today I'm very glad that I can make a presentation about uh, monitoring wheat green area index using very high resolution satellites and the 3D radio tube transfer model. And the experiment networks are interesting to capture GBI interactions, and uh, they are corresponding to distributed sites will be uh, showing the contrasted environmental conditions. And the plot sites are typically from fewer square meters to 100 square meters. And it is difficult to monitor the, the experiment distributed in different sites, but the high spatial and the temporary Resolution satellite will be a, a best choice. And uh, in addition, GI is a key canopy state trait, and uh, its dynamics indicates the crop function. So we want to exploit a very high spatial and temporary resolution site satellites to monitor the GI over distributed site. Planet scope can offer the high spatial uh, and the temporary resolution imagery. And there are three different considerations. Uh, from the figure, we can see uh, the DAW Classic and DAW R uh, are launched in 2016, and they only have four bands. Uh, the Super DAW are launched in the 2020, and they have eight different bands. Uh, the images are available from mid-March 2020. And uh, its spectral bands are similar to those of Sentinel-2, well, with a good radiometric performance. And the planet scope can provide the top of canopy reflectance, including the atmospheric corrections. There are some approaches that use the to retrieve GI from satellite reflectance. And the data driven for weight is that they use a DAW R and DAW Classic imagery fused with the uh, Sentinel 2, and then 
we can reduce the inconsistency of the image. Uh, the fused imagery will be used to estimate the LAI in weight, and the RMSC is 1.17. So uh, we want to know that uh, the super dot eight bands uh, weather will be improved accuracy. And uh, the model driven for corn and soybean, a uh, one dimension radio tail trust model process was uh, combined with the planet imagery to estimate the LAI in corn and soybean. And the RMSE is one and 1.17 respectively. Uh, so whether the 3D, 3D radio tail trust model will be better? Uh, we want to develop a model-driven approach cover the four-dimension four structure model with the three-dimension radio tail model to generate a training data set with the GI and the corresponding reflectance. And then we will compare the performance with a data-driven approach to see the accuracy for GI retrieval using the Gauss process recreation. And finally, we want to exploit the satellite imagery to monitor the dynamics of crop growth. There are a large data set in GI measurements and eight sites in France, seven sites in China, uh, containing 328 GI ground measurements and uh, all of our GI measurements are considered the variability of several key factors, categories, climate, soil, and the cultural practice. And the plot size are from 6 meters to 100 meters. Uh, in France, the GI are estimated from the RGB image captured from uh, uh, 57, and in China, all of the GI measurements are from the destructive. We conduct the image preprocessing in Google's engine, and the harmonization tools will be used to improve the special temporary radiometric consistency of data between the scenes and the sensors. And then uh, the eight UDM beds uh, provided by uh, planning labs will be used to mask the cloud and the other unusable pixels. Atmospheric correction will be conducted to getting the uh, top of canopy reflectance from the satellite imagery. And the image co-registration will be conducted to uh, check the pixel change through time. So from the figure, we can see before code registration, the main offset uh, of each uh, uh, satellite imagery is uh, 2.58 pixels. And after code registration, the main offset for each satellite imagery is uh, 0 0.89 pixels. So after the correction, um, the accuracy is better than 1 pixel. From this radio, we can see uh, the ideal weight can describe the dynamics of change of three, uh, three dimension architecture in the weight group. Less is an efficient retracing that based the three dimension radio tail trust model, uh, which can simulate the multi spectral or hyperspectral images and the uh, bi directional reflect vector. Uh, thermal infrared images, LiDAR singles, and so on. So we want to use uh, the last three-dimension radio tail trust model to simulate the canopy reflectance. A prospect model was used to simulate the leaf spectral reflectance and the transmittance. A success model was used to simulate the illumination conditions. Um, the soil reflectance, leaf properties, canopy structure, illumination conditions will be input to the last model. And then we can simulate the top of canopy reflectance. In order to make the uh, simulated reflectance closed to uh, actual satellite characteristics, we add some absolute and relative noise.
Lighting hypercube sampling was used to simulate the top of canopy reflectance and the corresponding GI. Uh, 10,000 simulations were generated from for this research until now. And we use the Gauss process regression for GI estimation. Uh, the kernel function that is the ARD exponential kernel and the covariance is the exponential kernel function. Uh, there is a separate length scale for each predictor. Uh, the GPR will be used both for data-driven and model-driven approaches. Here are the workflow of GI estimation. And uh, in the data-driven approach, the imagery will be downloaded from the planning labs. And uh, after some pre-processing, uh, such as the atmospheric collection, calibration, and the cloud mask, the top of canopy reflectance will be used for training. And the training is cross-size uh, validation, uh, cross-size training, so we can get the uh, each uh, estimation model for, for each site. And the model driven, uh, th the three dimension radio tail trace model will be used to simulate the uh, top of canopy reflectance. And then we add some noise to the reflectance. So we can also get a GI estimation model from, for the, from the simulated reflectance. The model validation process is completely independent of the training process, and the observed data set were used to validate the model from a data-driven and the model-driven approach. Uh, after smoothing, we can get the dynamics of each site. This is the distribution of observed reflectance and the simulated reflectance. From the figure, we can see uh, they have the same range and the same distribution. We also compare the data-driven and the model-driven approach. Uh, from the figure, we can see model-driven approach is slightly better than data-driven approach. And the RMSC is closed to 0 0.9, R square is closed to 0 0.7. Um, however, in the data driven approach, when the GI value is greater than 4, uh, the, the model is uh, underestimated. And uh, uh, that is because the observed reflectance uh, lacks the high, the observed data set lacks the high GI value. and uh, they can't estimate the high GI. So in the and the, in the model driven approach, at the early stage or when the greater when the GI value is greater than four, uh, the model is uh, overestimated. That is due to uh, the the poor uh authenticity of the three D structure at the early stage. And uh, in addition, there is only 10,000 simulations were used to training the model. So maybe it can't enough to represent the entire growth stage. So we should uh, add the data. Um, here are the GI dynamics. Uh, there, are, there are four different sites. And uh, as you can see, Jirong and Wuchao is a small plot, small plot size. Uh, their size is 10 by 10 meters. And the green points represent the true GI value. The red points represent the estimated GI value from the reflectance. And the, the blue line represents the, uh, the smoothing dynamics of GI. The blue range represents the standard uh, dimension of the prediction. Uh, from the figure, we can see in the small plot, uh, the, 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 the estimation uh, ability is poor. And uh, after smoothing, the RMSEO model-driven 
is still lower than that of the data-driven. So data-driven approach has a high uh, uncertainty during the whole uh, growth stage. Uh, using the simulated data set uh, generated by three-dimension radio tail trust model, we test the uh, performance of data-driven approach, and we consider the different combinations of uh, measurement noise and the number of the observations. So from the figure, we can see uh, the performance of data-driven will increase uh, with the increment of uh, uh, of observations and uh, decrease of the measurement noise. So potentially, we could uh, achieve improved performance for the data-driven approach uh, through the increasing the number of observations or uh, with much accurate GI measurements. Uh, in conclusion, we can see the SuperDoll image can monitor the accurate accurate GI over the small plots, and the quality and quantity of data set is a key to improve the retrieval accuracy. A model-driven approach is slightly better than data-driven approach from the uh, result. So maybe we can combine these two approach using and the assemble approach to further improve the estimation. And that's all of my presentation. Uh, thanks for your attention. The next uh, talk is uh, by Alexis Joly from uh, INRIA, and it's about plant, plant disease characterization. So, good morning everyone. So, my name is Alexis Joly. So, I'm a computer scientist uh, at INRIA <coughs> and uh, I'm the co leader of uh, PlantNet. So, PlantNet is a worldwide uh, citizen observatory um, that is based on artificial intelligence to help people identify plants with their smartphone. And, uh, and so, today I won't speak about plant species identification. I will rather speak about some investigations we conducted towards extending the PlantNet platform uh, to uh, plant uh, disease identification. So probably my speech would have better fit yesterday afternoon station, but I was not available, sorry, so <laughs> here I am. All right. Uh, so, as you know, identifying plant disease is very important towards developing more efficient and uh, more eco-friendly uh, pest control uh, solutions. And uh, in this regard, developing automated uh, disease identification solutions um, could really uh, facilitate uh, the, the process, uh, avoiding costly human uh, expertise. So. Um, of course, deep learning are solving very efficient tasks now. And uh, for instance, with regards to plant identification, we are now able to identify thousands, tens of thousands of species with very high accuracy. Uh, but disease recognition is a harder problem. So first, you have a more complex hypothesis space requiring to really disentangle uh, the traits of the host from the traits of the disease itself. And uh, also, you have a very high ambiguity of visual symptoms between one disease from, a, from another one, and a high variability of that symptoms uh, depending on the context. So there already exist some applications. Uh, I cite plant, uh, Plantix here, which is one of the most used uh, in the world, uh, which is fine and really used in some contexts, in Thailand in particular. Uh, but still, the performance is still moderated, and so yeah, you see that in the ratings of the app that sometimes it does not work. So there is still a large margin uh, for improvement uh, of the performance. 
So we started this project in 2018, and uh, the work I will present today was mainly done by a postdoc uh, who is called uh, Li Xiu Han, and we are still collaborating with her, and now she's uh, associate professor at uh, Swedenborg University. Uh, so this was basically the state of the art in 2018, so now there are other works, sorry. Uh, but mainly there were some crop-specific disease classification systems and multi-crops disease classification uh, approaches. And so we are more interested by the second one because yeah, in PlantNet we really try to develop worldwide solutions working on any plants and so on. Uh, so, and these are three of the main cited works related to multi-crop disease uh, data sets and uh, models. And uh, so they are typically working with uh, tens of disease and tens of crops. And uh, so building a data set and evaluating it with some state-of-the-art deep learning models. And as you can see, they reach very high accuracy levels, so like 90, 90.5% accuracy. So my background is mainly in machine learning, so when I see such a score, I know there is a problem. <laughs> Uh, so, what's the problem? So, basically, one of the first problems is really in the split itself, so in the evaluation methodology, so they just do a random split of the data, and so you are in, regardless, all the potential bias you can have, and the second problem is that there is a strong lack of diversity in the data sets, and uh, so that it doesn't work at all uh, in real-world context. Uh, so, just regarding the bias, so here I see two diseases, of tomato, and uh, so as you see, probably the system will rather learn to distinguish the background that is more blue here and gray here, or it will maybe learn the orientation of the leaf, so here you see that it's not the same. So when you construct such a data set, there is a lot of potential bias, and so even if you try to think about it, if there is a single or two person creating that data set, uh, in a, the same environment, you have all that potential bias. So what happens if you test a model trained on these plant village data sets and you test it on other data sets, and so instead of having 90.97% accuracy, yeah, you have rather yeah, 36 or 20% accuracy, right? And you can also look at what the network sees uh, by some, yeah, you look at the activations of the neurons and you plot that on your image. <coughs> and uh, you can see that often the attention is not on the infected areas, indeed. So that means that the network is training something else. So here it's rather the venations, but sometimes it's the background or it can be a lot of things. So we have tried uh, different approaches to try improving uh, these performances. Uh, so one of the first work uh, uh, on which uh, Sue worked was attention-based recurrent neural networks. So a recurrent neural network allows to train statistical dependencies between the different parts of the images and then combine that. And uh, attention-based is another mechanism that really allows the model to learn where to look precisely on the pixel. So he, he learns an attention map uh, in addition to the features. And so the, this enforced to really focus on some specific parts of the image. So by doing this, you can have some improvements. So if I look at the same test sets, and here we created the uh, uh, another test set on Plant Village itself, but you, we removed one of the crop uh, from the data set, so one of the class. Uh, so and you can see that yeah, by using this attention-based recurrent CNN, you can have some improvements uh, on, in terms of accuracy. And so you can also try to visualize the parts that have been learned and so here it's just a qualitative result. So on this one, it's really focusing on the <laughs> disease part, so maybe not on all. So another uh, method we experimented to try focusing on disease-specific features rather than crop-specific features. 
uh, is to focus more on visual symptoms. So with the idea that some crops uh, are infected by diseases with similar symptoms, and typically you can extract this information from the common name of the disease. So different crops have the same have diseases with the same common name, and usually it's very similar symptoms. Um, <clears throat> and so somehow you have a crop disease matrix, so some crop have the same disease, uh, a disease can be in different crops, and one of the disease class is the healthy class, of course, and the healthy class is common to all the crops. And so what we tried is simply to train a classifier only on the disease, regardless of the crop, okay? Just a simple approach. And just doing this, you have some better performance. You improve the classification because you're more focused on the disease features than on the crop features themselves. So, but of course, in a real world system like PlantNet, we would like to identify both the crop and the disease uh, simultaneously. And so then we work on joint prediction models, and in particular, a conditional model. So with the idea that your joint probability, so of species and disease, is the probability of the species multiplied by the probability of the disease knowing the species, okay? The species only have some potential uh, disease. And so we built <coughs> a model architecture that is doing that. And so, as you see, it's a convolutional neural network. There are some shared features, and then there are some task-specific features for disease uh, for species and for uh, disease. And for the disease classifier, the disease classifier, it takes advantage of the disease-specific feature, but it also learns from the, uh, the crop-specific uh, features as a context. And so this can be done uh, through specific conditional functions that, uh, that learns the current, yeah, the, 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 the more useful proportion of crop information to be included in the disease classifier. Uh, so we also created a new evaluation data set uh, in the context of this work. So basically we aggregated uh, four uh, data sets, so Plant Village, Digipato, SIPM, and we also included PlantNet images, so mainly for the healthy class, okay? It's for just the healthy class, plants that are not infected by a disease. Uh, so this provides more diversity, and we also used an impotent test set uh, from a, in RAE, uh, the Ifitia team, uh, about three different uh, diseases. So, and we compared several stuff. So, here it's the conditional model I talked about. The best one, as you see. <laughs> as you. Uh, and we compared to, yeah, just having two different uh, classifiers without the conditional. Uh, uh, stuff, uh, two separate models, completely separate models, uh, a really full joint species disease pairs, so this is the state of the art in uh, plant village and things like that. And, uh, and here a variant where you don't have a variant of this one where you use the same feature space for species and disease classification. So, and so as you see, you can have some gains uh, by trying to, to use this uh, conditional uh, information. Uh, we can also see that, uh, so here it's crop accuracy, disease accuracy, and the joint accuracy. Uh, there are some solutions that are not that bad also, that based on some practical constraints, you may prefer doing that, or yeah, this is more costly because you need two models. And this one works better, but requires yeah, some specific uh, uh, technologies that are not in PyTorch directly. Uh, but if we now evaluate on the independent test set uh, of NRAE, so still the performance are very bad. So this, the main reasons are, so these are difficult classes, so with not a lot of training data in the data sets. And there are some shifts, I mean, between the protocol they use to create this data and what we have in, training, in the training set, you still have some shifts in terms of uh, yeah, the protocol, the visual uh, appearance, and uh, things like that. So <coughs> still needs to progress on that. And we need more training data. 
And so that's an important point. So how to collect massive and diverse training data? And basically, we did that for PlantNet. So when we started PlantNet 10 years ago, we were working on maybe 300 species, only uh, scans of leaves, you know. And, uh, and then we still uh, developed first models, and we delivered the app, and people started to enrich the database in a collaborative manner. So within the app, you can share your observation. The community can revise the observations. And when the observation is valid, then it will enrich the model. And so you will have a kind of virtuous circle like that uh, that allows to increase your database, increase your diversity, and get more and more data. And the valid part now is shared uh, at JB, for, for instance. So what we would like is to do the same for disease. Uh, so just repla replacing here, recognize diseases, and uh, to progressively have a growing community of farmers or people working on such uh, topics and, uh, and collect additional data. Uh, yeah, just to show that it could work. So these are the curves for plant net for the plant identification uh, problem, so for plant species. And so as you see along the time, along the years, uh, the volume of observations, of user accounts, and of covered species increased a lot. Uh, yeah. So it takes time, but it works. Uh, yeah, and another perspective towards improving performance is also, uh, of course, to use other information than the image itself, uh, typically climatic data, which are the most promising. <laughs> Um, so in our case, we are already working on species distribution models, so based on deep learning also, that takes into account environment and even satellite data to predict where species uh, is likely uh, to be observed. And so we believe we could also extend apply such, uh, such models to plan disease prediction and so then to improve the identification. And I'm done, I think. Yeah, thank you. Some questions? Yes, over there. Uh, thank you, very, very interesting. Um, we're, we're currently using, uh, like you mentioned yesterday, the Open Data Kit to try to, to do something similar. So, um, so it would be interesting to collaborate. Um, we've, we've currently amassed about 50,000 pictures, but, um, and we're using the, the, the disease paired with the crop model, basically we want to avoid looking so stupid as a farmer going to the field and taking a picture of his cucumber and having it say tomato. But um, we also went run into weird instances of people taking pictures of other random things and being like, it classified me as a tomato, your model is terrible. I, I, never, I never quite understood that. But we're, we're trying to get uh, an estimate of the number of pictures that we need uh, per disease to, to fit these deep learning models. So. How, how big does the big data need to get? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can give you, so regarding your first remarks, so yeah, of course we will be interested yeah, for any collaboration, trying to share data and to, yeah, to, to work, and, and yeah, civil organisms and that. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, regarding the numbers, I can provide you the numbers in, in PlantNet to provide you an idea, but you always have a long tail, so I mean, you will always have a long tail, like, few species with many, many, many images and a lot of species with, uh, with less images. Uh, so in our case, for 40,000 species, uh, we have like 8 million images uh, in total. So it's like, yeah, training a model. I mean, if you have only a single node with four GPU, it's like 10 days, but then you can parallelize things. Uh, so, but in terms of big data, it provides you some idea of the, the amount of things. And if you want your system to be really performing, you need, yeah, I would say, at least 50 images per class to start something. I mean, that, pe that you have a chance that the species is recognized at least sometimes, people can validate it or things like that. And uh, yeah, and if you have 500 images per class, then it starts to work very well. But it really depends on the diversity. I mean, you need diversity. I mean, diversity is probably more important than the number. You, you really need diverse context uh, and diverse device, people, 
Yeah, we have we have people in five different countries, but um, we're, we were trying to include, I think the goal was 10 diseases for four target crops and stop there, so not going on to thousands of species. And, and we were sort of setting an arbitrary threshold of uh, once we have a thousand pictures from the collaborators, then we'll include it into the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thousands. You are good. Uh, thanks for all this very nice presentation. Um, when training, did you use the data augmentation, pseudo labeling, uh, those kind of techniques, or? Yeah, yeah. Clearly, data augmentation uh, as much as we can. <laughs> uh, no pseudo labeling, not in that works. Uh, so yeah, we have batch normalization, uh, and that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, during uh, your whole cycle of the learning process, how do you handle the uh, unknown class? So for example, you, you, you have some people, some users just take some pictures that you never had in your previous models. What, what are you going to do with that? <coughs> yeah, so in PlantNet, we have reject, supervised rejection, so which is the first mechanism. So. In that case, we just collect images of dogs, of humans, of uh, anything you can take in picture because yeah, people are completely crazy. So I, I, don't <laughs> give, I don't give you the data is because you don't want to know. Uh, but yeah, so the first thing is that we, we annotate manually data from the query feeds uh, of the application and because to avoid shifts. I mean, the only way you have to solve that is really to annotate the data people send to your application and uh, include them uh, as a rejection class. Uh, yeah, and then we have also some thresholds and confidence. For, for instance, for the JB, if we have a lot of validation mechanism uh, based on yeah, AI thresholds, uh, user ratings, and things like that for the, yeah, to, to filter uh, high quality data. So. Yeah, thank you, Alexis. So, um, Coming back to the same question, how would you avoid having false positive? I mean, people uploading pictures and saying this is that kind of disease and validating things. Do you have a network of pathologists working with you? And uh, so on pathology so far, no, because this, this is what we want to do. But uh, for species, the idea is that among the community of PlantNet users, you have really a gradient from the most expert users to the less expert users. And so each of them, uh, we assign them a weight that is trained automatically based on their activity in the platform and based on the number of validated observations and number of species they have. And so each user has a different rate. And so then they collaboratively revise the data. And uh, yeah, if you are a plus plus expert, you just say this and this is in the database. But if you are just using the app for the first time, you have no chance to, <laughs> yeah, to do anything. So yeah, you have to first prove that you have some confidence uh, for the system. So, so I, <laughs> Sorry, I have one. <laughs> do, do you have specific, uh, specific handling of uh, unbalanced classes in your algorithms? Uh, yeah, so we are doing several things. So like over sampling, under sampling, you know, uh, with data augmentation. So you are trying to limit the number of uh, of images for the most uh, frequent classes and use more data augmentation for the, the, the species in the long tail. And we also have some specific losses, so like LDAM, which is like state of the art for imbalance classification in deep learning. And we have a PhD student working on a new one that is still under review at ICML, but that is better than this one. <laughs> um, Sometimes I have problem with the notion of truth. So when you compare species, probably truth is not too difficult because uh, it, it's a sunflower or it's uh, something else. Uh, is it the same case for, for disease? And especially uh, you, you had not terribly good uh, result with uh, phytopathologists. Does this mean that uh, they have a different uh, definition of the truth, whatever it means? Uh, than other people? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> no, I mean, so 
yeah, we are trying to understand really the, why the performance is less good on that images. So really, it seems that it's it's not the labels in the training data that are false because we also ask this experts to like review. I mean, all, all the the data sets we use, it's just a mix of data sets from the literature, and I think the labels are, are good. I mean, th th these are the good labels, so it's really more a matter of, of diversity and of shifts between the, the visual content. And, uh, and I know the, the, these INRAE uh, pictures are highly, very, very good quality taken. So it's in the field, but, but they, they, they really look different. I mean, when you look at the training data and their data, that there is a visual difference. And so, so either you need some domain adaptation, specific domain adaptation techniques on which we did not work so far, or we need their data in the training set, which of course will be the, be the better thing to, to do. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, when you have when you will have like collaborative validation, so we will also need this principle of who is expert, who is not, and it will be more difficult than for plant species because it's even more difficult to validate, even more. So all will be harder, clearly. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Maybe we can move to the next one. So Mario Sewa from Arvalis and CAPT, we will speak about the maize competition. Well, uh, yeah, hello. Uh, so I'll talk about today um, about yeah, phenotyping for um, plasticity characterization, uh, especially and specifically for uh, maize, because that's my, uh, uh, that's my subject for my thesis. And I will try to uh, show you some part of work that I did uh, during my first, uh, my first year. And I would like to uh, yeah, thank first uh, all the entities that, I, that you can see there, especially Avalis and Inrive, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, so yeah, I won't teach you anything, but um, the uh, um, plants can respond through their um, by being uh, initially well uh, genetically adapted at the, for a given uh, environment by phenotypic plasticity. Uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> yeah, plasticity. In fact, uh, with uh, faced uh, the, the ability of express some traits, adapt the, themselves. Uh, according to local uh, environment uh, changes, or both, with uh, there there is often an, an interaction between those two, uh, which is not so linear. But for a sake of simplicity, we've drawn um, some some linear reaction norms, and yet yeah, this is a lively uh, discussion subject, uh, since uh, in fact Darwin uh, the phenotypic uh, uh, variability. And uh, it's even more uh, important for cessar organism, static, like uh, plants, of course, uh, and maize, uh, any plants, because they are fixed. Um, so there is, <coughs> in fact, a trade-off uh, between maximizing like, uh, light interception and minimizing plant intraspecific competition. Um, and it, is, uh, it has been uh, um, uh, studied over several fetal elements, like stem, uh, with elongation, uh, expansion with leaves, uh, or uh, reorientation. And in fact, there is a theory that um, some phytochromes are um, involved in this, in this process because we see that um, for a mutant hybrids without any active phytochromes, uh, it produces less, much, uh, much less biomass than active ones. And in fact, uh, phytochromes are uh, quite involved in the um, mutual shading avoidance uh, mechanism phenomenon, and that's why uh, uh, that's a, a theory that, that is quite uh, recent. In fact, uh, with uh, in 2000, uh, yeah, in 2019. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's really uh, important then to uh, study plasticity since the um, uh, things uh, positive trends in maize yield over the last decades. Um, in fact. Uh, I've been the reason not only of uh, genetic but also agronomic factors, plant management, uh, cultural practices, well, all that kind of thing, you get the idea. And when we talk about plasticity, we talk, uh, we talk about uh, non-plasticity or negative plasticity, because in fact, uh, plasticity um, 
involve uh, involves some um, some energy and thanks to physical laws it uh, also induces some costs and uh, limits so uh, yeah, it's really important to take into account because one of favorable favorable traits for a given character could be correlated with another one which isn't favorable for this same uh, given character and uh, we have to then uh, compare a, a global set of traits that could be involved in plasticity. So I won't spend a, a lot of time on this slide because um, the only thing that I said uh, is that structural and architectural um, on the above plants, uh, above ground uh, plant material is really important because it's uh, where it occurs all the um, relationships and links that I said right before uh, there in, uh, in uh, plastic and uh, structural traits and it, uh, the canopy structure in uh, those two uh, famous traits uh, have a huge impact in light interception, of course, as we already, uh, already said in the last um, few uh, presentations. Uh, in fact, there is a, a little of, um, there is a little of, um, of lack of knowledge of plasticity and phenotypes. Uh, the, um, the references uh, in plasticity uh, studies are uh, quite old at the beginning of the century, uh, and of course they didn't um, uh, use the uh, high throughput phenotyping, which permit now to have a huge volume of data, and that could be uh, really useful, uh, especially that uh, there is a breeding uh, turnover which tends to increase in some areas, and uh, which is uh, already high in some uh, others, and it's uh, high throughput phenotyping could then help to uh, well characterize and uh, limit the strength to uh, maize selection and breeding turnover by having a, a huge amount of, of data. Uh, so that's why uh, we've set up. Yeah, I can see. Uh, that's why we set up in uh, last year in uh, Avignon. Uh, so this is um, uh, an experimental design with uh, five different hybrids with different shapes. When I say shapes, it means uh, different, uh, different uh, crown diameters, height, uh, leaf angle, etc. that was determined empirically. And uh, we added a factor, um, yeah, a factor with four modalities, which is called rectangularity, from one to eight, which means uh, rectangularity, which is the ratio of interplant and inter-row distances. And you can see that there is a gradient uh, um, with um, with a different from low to high uh, competitive uh, environment. And again, thanks to um, high throughput and typing, we could have some distribution, for example, there for the azimuthal uh, deviation from the row, where we detected plants thanks to uh, RGB images and um, the HM matrix to get the ridge detection. Uh, so talking about azimuthal uh, deviation uh, angle from the row uh, there, when we, once we, you have all the distribution there uh, for a given date, for example, and for all the plots, you can have this type of um, ANOVA, for, well, this type of polar plot matrix that was done with ANOVA with all the significant, significant differences with the postdoc analysis uh, just above. And the first thing to say that is, of course, uh, plasticity exists, which is quite a great thing. <laughs> that would be an upload, I think, if not. But um, in fact, there is a, yeah, a gradient, and you can see that um, the more the, the plants are near from each other, and the more you will have um, the entire space that will be filled with uh, leaves, of course. Uh, so this is with ANOVA. You can see the road direction, and this is quite uh, visually uh, interesting. So this is when it is plastic, but it's, it also occurred that Sometimes it's, it is not for this genotype, for example, the distribution is quite constant and even visually you can see that it is really different from uh, genotype 1, for example. And uh, of course this is for a given date, but thanks to high throughput phenotyping, <coughs> you could have um, three different dates, for example, that's what we done, uh, we did. And um, for example, this fascist and distance, I, I won't explain much, but it permits to have uh, the evolution of plasticity along times. And you can see that the uh, onset of reorientation into the um, antero space uh, occurs around four or five uh, visible leaves. So you can see there. 
and uh, when it occurs, because as I already said, for the third gen type, this is not the case. So this is uh, quite classical methods, ANOVA, which is a statistical robust method, but it only gives uh, differences, you know, significant differences in uh, distributions, uh, distribution or groups, uh, but it exists some uh, other indices. For example, this index is the RDPI, which permits to rank species according to their plasticity. And um, it permits to quantify the plasticity according, uh, quantify plasticity per unit of uh, environmental on change. You can see the pairwise comparison matrix with all the rectangularity there for a given date. And we can say that we can quantify that genotype 2 is more plastic than, um, for, example, for example, genotype 4. Uh, 1, 5 are quite similar. And genotype 3 is, uh, as we said, is quite uh, rigid, non plastic as we already said. So thanks again with I propose of with phenotyping in general, we can also have another tool, which is the profile extraction, uh, skeleton uh, extraction, in fact, where we could have, uh, for example, uh, leaf fungal, we could extract some traits, architectural traits like uh, leaf fungal, or uh, leaf curvature, uh, thanks to the, the ratio of these two distances for each leaf. and uh, when I, I, I talked earlier about a um, set of traits that could be uh, positively and negatively uh, correlated, uh, this is a case of verticality because you see there uh, for the third genotype, which is uh, the most uh, rigid, the non-plastic genotype, uh, it, this, is, this is the genotype with the most curved lived. You can see there, face to this. And uh, with the average, the highest leaf average, uh, average leaf angle, sorry. Uh, and then we can wonder if there is a, a duality, if there is a, a link between vertical and uh, horizontal um, uh, distribution, horizontal distribution being the uh, azimuth uh, deviation angle. Especially since, uh, for example, this uh, study showed that uh, plots with most erected leaves. Um, fits a smaller extinction coefficient. So it, it means that uh, light is going deeper into the canopy and is, di is uh, distributed more uniformly. Another study uh, is showed that, in fact, uh, the maize selection towards, um, has progressed towards uh, uh, plots with the most, uh, most erected leaves, uh, which permit, again, to have a a uh, light which is going deeper into the canopy. So this is the RH uh, pad already uh, presented uh, yesterday by uh, François, Ter François Terdieu. And a very recent um, uh, study that plays with um, leaf angle, keeping the same uh, shape, the, the same leaf shape, and uh, seeing the canopy uh, occupation volume and um, light uh, interception. So that's uh, why we're going more and more into some uh, creation of functional trait spaces. Uh, so to, to really um, get the impact of each trait on uh, a given character, for, for example, uh, harvest index, biomass, uh, yield, uh, whatever. And uh, this is why I try to do, I try to do um, modestly uh, on the Avignon uh, experiment. There you can see that uh, on the vertical distribution, the, the genotype 3 is quite apart from the other. There you can see there is a, a gradient from a rectangularity 1 to 8 on the azimuthal deviation. And there is a shift in height, this is height, um, between a density of 12 plants per square meter with a rectangularity 8 and 2, faced to the two other with a density of 6 plants per square meter. So next, uh, this is the last slide. What will be done? Um, well, in fact, in very few days and weeks, I would say, we will normally be able to uh, extract traits directly from the field thanks to uh, LiDAR point clouds. Uh, in, in fact, we, we started some uh, experiments based on the experimental design of Avignon, but with two more blocks in uh, Montardon-Pau uh, Montardon uh, in the southwest of France. 
uh, and then we would be able to extract directly from field all the traits that will be, um, then we will get all the distribution necessary to uh, do realistic distribution, to do some um, canopy, uh, synthetic canopy creation, and then we, we could uh, then uh, do some uh, ray tracing algorithm, radiative budget, radiosity, uh, and whatever to, uh, to link these structural traits to uh, yield or biomass. That's it. Okay, thank you, Mario. Some questions? No, 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 you're angry, maybe. <laughs> Thanks for the nice talk. I think this is a very nice trait, this uh, orienting the leaf inside the rose. And I figure that maybe this is also a trait which was heavily um, bred for by the breeding companies, because if you walk through a modern maize stand, you always have the leaves in your face. So actually, was there, do you check if there are old varieties, if there's succession from old varieties to new varieties, and the new varieties are not really having any variation in that trade anymore? Uh, you mean during uh, just uh, which uh, physical? Okay. If you compare old varieties with new varieties, is actually there uh, a change uh, in that responsiveness? I didn't check, uh, to be honest. You should probably do that. No, because uh, it's my, this is uh, quite an interesting uh, point, yeah. And but the same the applies for leaf orientation, because yeah, it's also yeah. a trade which was heavily bred for by the breeders. Yes, have you checked, uh, Mario, the, the changes in leaf angle within the same, I mean, within the canopy on different levels? Uh, we tried to do this because uh, we, in, uh, in Avignon experiment, we had a literal with the stereo vision. Uh, but in fact, uh, there is two things. We, first, we tried to do this uh, with directly the stereo vision from literal. Uh, when the, um, in early stages, in fact, because uh, it will be complicated then. Uh, and uh, once we, we reach, I would say, uh, 10, 12 leaves, uh, about, uh, we, we've tried to uh, do some deep learning uh, with one uh, images, trying to um, get the um, depth image uh, of stereo vision. And this is some work that we would try to um, uh, to improve, but it's yeah we, we've we've already uh, tried that, that thing to uh, really get the uh, if uh, if um, sorry if the um, leaves near the ear were, was the most active. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a big debate. You yeah, have yeah. papers saying that it, it changes across. I mean, the canopy. And hmm. And it has impacts on yeah. even on water use. Uh, yeah, but well, yeah. we'll get uh, more uh, information about that, especially with LIDAR, which uh, will be uh, quite a, a big thing. Uh, yeah. Okay, someone else? No, so we can move to the next uh, speaker. So I think it's remote also. And it's uh, Shu Yang Yu from Nanjing University, and he will speak about monitoring the leaf appearance dynamics. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Shu Yang Liu from the Phoenix Lab in Nanjing Agricultural University in China. Thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure to present our work on monitoring the dynamics of leaf number at a junior stage in the field using 3D plant model and the dormant adaptation. The dynamics of leaf number brings the critical information of the phenological stage. This would be very useful to guide field cultivation practices. Besides, it could be used to evaluate the growth rate among cultivars or under different environments. However, conventionally, the leaf number is collected by manual counting or labeling in the field. This is very low throughput with very high uncertainty. 
you may see from this figure that each in each single leaf, the leaf tip is a very strong structural feature. They are easy to be identified and difficult to be covered by the neighboring leaves. So it seems a good idea to train deep learning models targeting at leaf tip to count the leaf numbers. However, the leaf tips are very tiny objects. You may see from this figure that uh, each single uh, red point uh, um, correspond to one um, uh, leaf tip. So uh, as uh, leaf tips uh, are so tiny objects uh, in such complicated soil background, it is a challenging task for object detection models. Additionally, constructing big, diverse, and accurate uh, training data set uh, for such a tiny object would be very time consuming. Simulation provides a potential way to tackle the challenges uh, um, presented above. Theoretically, we could uh, generate, uh, generate simulated images and uh, the corresponding annotations automatically using the simulator. Uh, then we could train the model uh, using the um, uh, simulated images directly. This would uh, be a, a completely unsupervised approach with no need for tedious labeling. However, in fact, uh, um, simulator uh, cannot perfectly uh, capture re reality. Uh, this would cause a discrepancy between the simulation and the, the reality. The difficulty of transforming a simulated experience into the reality is often called the simulation to reality gap or the reality gap. So, Minimizing the reality gap is critical to realize the completely unsupervised approach. In this study, we would use two strategies to minimize the reality gap. Firstly, we will try to improve the realism of the 3D model. Secondly, we would use a dormant adaptation model to transform some actual features into the simulated images. Firstly, regarding the, um, the first strategy, we used a, a digital plant phenotyping platform, D3P, uh, that is developed by our previous work. D3P could simulate the three-dimensional dynamics of weight canopy structure using prior knowledge of the ecophysiological processes. Then we choose the semi-physically based ray tracer probably to simulate the images for different configurations. Here, the small animation shows the dynamics of a 3D uh, weight canopy structure simulated by the D3P. Specifically, uh, we firstly sample parameters from the D3P to generate a 3D weight canopy structure covering a wide range of variabilities. Then in the ranging process, we considered various sighting of lighting conditions, uh, soil background, and the leaf texture. The realism of the simulated images would increase with the number of uh, factors considered. This would be very useful to reduce the reality gap. Regarding the second strategy, domain adaptation model, we, select, we selected the state-of-the-art generative adversarial network cycle gun. It could translate the 
uh, Dauben of the synthetic data set into the targeted Dauben of the real image. The great advantage of CycleGAN is that it doesn't need uh, um, paired images. More importantly, uh, after translation, images would preserve um, the position uh, the position of the labels uh, that automatically uh, generated by the D3P. So you see this figure. Uh, this is the original image um, simulated by D3P. Uh, this is a real image. Uh, this is the same to real uh, image uh, after uh, cyclogram translation. It looks uh, uh, much more realistic than the original one. And uh, here uh, it is the corresponding uh, labels uh, um, automatically uh, simulated by uh, this repeat. In this work, uh, we generated uh, 15,000 synthetic images. It contains over 2 million labels. Of course, we could uh, uh, generate a uh, um, much larger um, data set. It's just a matter of, uh, of time cost. Um, uh, our method uh, greatly uh, improve the quantity, diversity, and accuracy of the data set with very high efficiency. We also took uh, uh, real images from the field. Uh, in this study, uh, we would focus on the stage from uh, about uh, one leaf per plant uh, to about uh, four, uh, four leaves per plant. This is because tailoring uh, starts uh, around the three or four leaves per plant. After tailoring, uh, the canopy uh, would grow much faster and uh, become difficult to identify all the leaves in the canopy. Here it is the result. We evaluate the performance of 10 different uh, approaches um, over real manual labeled images across uh, four stages from uh, ON stage one uh, to four. Uh, we found that using a dormant adaptation uh, could greatly improve the performance. Uh, the model performs uh, uh, the mobile the model performs uh, generally uh, uh, performance uh, generally uh, degrades in the later stages uh, among uh, all the um, uh, uh, um, approaches with dormant adaptation uh, cyclogan uh, plus fast rcn uh, performs uh, the best um, we used the TSNE method to project the data set into two dimensions. Uh, we found that uh, the disc uh, discrepancy uh, between the synthetic data set and the real data set um, has been um, um, much minimized after dormant adaptation. Uh, this could partly uh, explain uh, why we could get a much better results using dormant adaptation. Um, using uh, our uh, simulation platform, D3P, uh, we could uh, easily uh, explore the impact of uh, uh, critical factors on the estimation accuracy. Here, uh, we conducted an uh, in silico experiment with a special uh, resolution um, varying from uh, 0 0.1 millimeter to uh, 2 millimeter. The results uh, show that uh, special res resolution um, uh, impact uh, significantly uh, on the uh, estimation uh, accuracy. Uh, however, uh, as long as the special resolution uh, is better than uh, one millimeter, um, the, uh, we could always get uh, uh, quite a satisfactory estimation with R-square uh, larger than 0 0.8.
uh, thanks for uh, uh, our collaborators from USA, uh, France, uh, China, uh, Japan, and Australia. Uh, we further test our model using data sets from five countries with uh, 11 locations. Here I put uh, um, the, uh, the, well, uh, the test result uh, from the French and uh, the Chinese data set. We could uh, uh, always get a good estimation of leaf number from um, uh, this very diverse um, uh, data set. Uh, we uh, applied our model uh, in the time theory uh, images provided by Professor Scott Chapman from the University of Queensland. Uh, you, you may see from this figure, uh, we could get the dynamics of uh, leaf numbers. We conducted a similar uh, time series observation um, over different cultivars in China using the uh, time, uh, the, the temperature information and the corresponding uh, the dynamics of leaf number estimated by our algorithm, we could uh, um, derive uh, the critical functional traits, philocoin. Philocoin is um, a thermal time uh, interval uh, between the onset of uh, successive leaves on the same stem. It is a very important uh, uh, traits uh, to characterize the growth rate or predict the phenological stage. Uh, we compare the uh, phenocoin uh, as mated by our algorithm and uh, the value um, uh, by manual measurement. Uh, the results are quite consistent with R square uh, equals to uh, 0 0.87. Um, uh, our algorithm uh, allows uh, uh, to accurately uh, high throughput uh, phenotyping uh, philocoin uh, in the field. We could uh, conclude that. Uh, here it is the conclusion. Uh, in this study, uh, we developed a method to accurately estimate leaf tips in the field at a juvenile stage. Um, we, uh, we generated uh, more than 15,000 uh, same-to-real images with more than 2 million labels. Soon, we will make this data set open access. Uh, we develop a high super phenotyping method for the, field, uh, for the estimation of philocoin in the field uh, with time series images at uh, junior stage. Finally, uh, the method uh, proposed here uh, is uh, completely unsupervised with no need for tedious labeling. Uh, this strategy uh, developed here uh, could be easily extended to other applications where labeling is difficult, uh, such as semantic segmentation. Uh, okay, here is a, a small animation uh, simulated by D3P. Um, thanks for your attention. Uh, you could reach me by uh, by my email. Thanks.